open this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. Today, the committee will continue its examination of the additional estimates for 2021-2022 with the cross-portfolio hearing on Indigenous matters. The committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure the supplementary budget estimates 2021-2022 hearings are conducted in a COVID-safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering to these arrangements. Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. The committee would appreciate if senators could please provide any written questions on notice to the Secretariat by Friday the 4th of March 2022. However, reminds all senators as well as departments and agencies that written questions on notice can be provided at any time. The committee has fixed Friday the 25th of March 2022 as the date for the return of answers to questions taken on notice. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimates hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations from the parliament or its committees unless the parliament has expressly provided otherwise. I particularly draw the attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009 specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. The Senate has also resolved that an officer of a Department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. An officer called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly and into the microphones to assist Hansard to record proceedings. I remind everyone in the hearing room to switch off your mobile phone and other devices or turn them to silent. I also remind those senators and witnesses appearing via video conference who are not speaking to mute your microphones. Officers are requested to keep opening statements brief or seek to incorporate longer statements into the Hansard. And I note that we have already received some statements from witnesses this morning for that purpose. Finally, the committee has agreed to allow media into the hearing room. In doing so, the committee reminds the media that they must follow the directions of the committee and the secretariat and remain within those areas clearly marked for the media. In addition, recording must not occur from behind the committee or between the committee and the witnesses, and computer screens and documents belonging to senators must not be filmed, photographed or recorded. Witnesses are reminded that they can object to being recorded at any time. The committee thanks the media in advance for maintaining a COVID-safe approach while in the hearing room. I'd like to welcome Senator the Honourable Amanda Stoker, representing the Minister for Indigenous Australians, Ms Jodie Bruin, Chief Executive Officer of the National Indigenous Australians Agency, and via video conference, Mr Joe Morrison, Group Chief Executive Officer of the Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation, and other officers. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement at this time? No, thank you, Chair. Ms Bruin, do you wish to make an opening statement at this time? No, thank you. Thank you. Mr Morrison, do you wish to make an opening statement at this time? I do, please. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Go ahead. Good morning, Mr. and Senators, for the opportunity to appear before you today. Despite the challenging operating caused by COVID-19, the IRC achieved its targets for 2020-21, track to deliver its 21-22 target. We have acquired three interests in land and waters for Indigenous people of our state, with two more approved and yet to be settled. We have granted seven to Indigenous corporations against our target of eight, with a further five approved yet to be transferred. We're, we are above our target of 90 active acquisition and management projects with 100 current active projects, and we are, we are on to meet our Indigenous employment and training targets. Our subsidiary voyages at the front of COVID-19 related travel restrictions are down due to low visitor numbers, but it remains operational 
for the year. Our strategy of agribusinesses operations continues with the exit of Isla subsidiary primary partners from Roebuck Plain Station in the Kimberley region in Australia and its handover to Nimbaburi Yaru in February. Plans to divest the National Indigenous Excellence Site in Redfern, Sydney continue with a transition plan. The number of milestones being met, the New South Wales Aboriginal Council will be the new owner of the NCI site by the July of this year. We've also had significant changes at our board. Ms. Kate Healy and Mr. Nigel Directors were appointed as directors of 2021. Mr. Ken is chair on the 1st of December 21. Ms. Adams Adamson is director on the 4th of January 2022. And Ms. Kirsty Masala is director effective March 2022. These changes to our board take effect as we embark on a significant period of consultation with Indigenous Australians, National Indigenous Land and Sea Strategy, a key policy document. Our NILS engagement will be supported for the by a number of Indigenous experts and by the ideas and aspirations of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people around the country. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Morrison. Um, I understand we have a couple of questions from Senator Ayres. Uh, I just uh, sent you a note. I was hoping that uh, we're waiting for Senator Lyons to jump online. Oh, right. Well, um, in, uh, I'm, I'm, happy I'm happy to go to Senator, um, Thorpe, Senator Thorpe if you Senator want to. Senator Thorpe, go you have the call. Apologies. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll just jump straight into it, given time. The Minister for Indigenous Australians announced a further appointment to the Indigenous Land and Sea Corporation Board. Ms. Christy Masella was appointed on a three-year term commencing 16th of March 2022. How are appointments to the board made? Uh, board appointments are made by the Minister with recommendation from the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Uh, so in terms of accountability and transparency to our people, what was the process? Was it a competitive process uh, or did the minister just handpick? Uh, Senator, that's probably uh, a question more um, easily answered by uh, the National Indigenous Agency, as we are uh, not party to that process. Does anyone else want to answer that? We might hand it over to Mr. Jacob. Am I saying that right? Jacob. Yes. Jacob. Jacob. There you go. I gave you a French flavour that you probably didn't need. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Brendan Jacob, Chief Lawyer, the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Uh, Senator, the, um, in relation to the uh, recent appointment uh, to ILSC Board, uh, the, uh, we used a process um, with uh, Carmichael Anthrop, um, identifying potential candidates um, that uh, meet the criteria as set out in the legislation uh, for a board member. Uh, and then that's put to the minister for his consideration. Would I be able to get the criteria uh, on notice? Yes, sir. Please. Senator. Thank you. Uh, we've seen issues with the board of the ILSC in the past. How confident should our people be that there are robust processes in place to make sure only appropriate people are appointed to the board? directed at me. I beg your pardon, Senator. Whoever wants to answer. Um, we just want some accountability and transparency to the people. Sure. And in terms of um, the government choosing and the government choosing their criteria, uh, how do you come up with appropriate people to be putting on these boards? Well, as you've, um, as you've heard from Mr Jacob, there's um, been an external process that's been engaged in and um, that's conducted using transparent criteria for which um, uh, you have sought them to be provided on notice, and they will be, mm -hmm. um, and then people are assessed against that criteria and recommendations are made. Ultimately, the discretion at the end lies with the minister, but um, in many ways that's appropriate because the minister is subject to principles of ministerial accountability. And um, if for some reason an appointment wasn't um, Stacking up, it would be the minister who um, is accountable for that. But um, we are very confident that the process is um, drawing out people who are entirely appropriate for the role. And um, the use of 
an independent search agency um, is part of the way that we make sure that we're getting the good from all the different parts of our community. Thank you. Uh, in February last year, the Minister for Indigenous Australians wrote to the chair of the ISLC, writing, I have decided not to support the appointment of the ILSC's preferred candidate, Joseph Morrison, due to a number of issues surrounding Mr Morrison's previous employment and departure which remain unresolved. I have some articles here that I'd like to table, please. Uh, the newspaper article mentioned that you were unaware of the Minister's lack of support for you, uh, Mr Morrison. Are you aware of that now? Uh, I, in fact, have had conversations with the Minister uh, at the ILSC, uh, confidential uh, conversations, and uh, I think we have to uh, work beyond that and continue working constructively for the benefit Indigenous as the uh, executive, chief executive officer of the ILSC. Could you tell us uh, what the issues were that the minister was referring to? Oh, I cannot tell you that because uh, I was not uh, sure what those issues were that the minister had uh, issue with. It is my understanding that it has been reported that you left a five-year post as CEO of the Northern Land Council due to misconduct allegations that you have denied. If you don't have the confidence of the minister, why do you think you are the best person to lead the ISLC? So I went through a recruitment process and I put my case forward in the normal uh, course of uh, recruitment and uh, I was not obviously the decider in that process um, and was uh, awarded the position. On the 4th of December 2021, press release announcing your appointment to the ILSC said that you had sat, and I quote, on the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy with the Prime Minister. That's a lie, isn't it? Oh, I think at the time it was a misquote. I was on a panel that was watching uh, the policy document. Uh, Mr. appeared by video conference I think uh, whether I sat on the panel and whether I appeared on a separate panel launching it uh, is where the mix uh, took place. So your actual role had been to sit on an expert panel webinar on December 3, the day before your new role was announced. Talk me through in detail how this alleged mistake was made on the press release. Yeah. Uh um, if you don't mind, I could probably answer that. Uh, Tricia Strad, Chief Operating Officer. Uh, I can confirm that the error was actually an ILSC uh, error in terms of our um, biography and the information that we had uh, pulled together and contributed to the police. Once we were alerted that that was actually not the, that there had been some confusion, uh, it was remedied. Since starting work with the corporation, Mr Morrison said he had not wit witnessed board dysfunction and that he expected the organisation to continue the high performance of the last two years. Are you saying that there has been nothing but high performance of the ILSC in the last two years? I think the ILSC has uh, sort of views and opinions about the former board uh, continued to meet its targets as required, the PBS targets, uh, and it's been able to continue on working uh, in partnership with Indigenous Australians. So does a high performance organisation have a Commonwealth Ombudsman public interest disclosure investigation report released with adverse findings in January 30, 2020? Suffer a board split over an attempt by chair to introduce new governance principles, 7th of May, 2020? A motion of no confidence in chair and acting CEO put and carried 17th of June 2020. A second motion of no confidence in chair is carried 19th of August 2020. And Vivian Tom is appointed to conduct, conduct a review and find as that there is a high risk the board can't fulfil its functions 25th of August 2020. Well, those uh, reviews and investigations uh, were not into the operation 
Oh, let's see, they were into the board governance uh, and the my time. And as I said earlier, Senator, the operations of the island continued to perform its functions and to meet its uh, expected time. So I'm, I might reiterate my first question. Do you think that, uh, would you say that there's been nothing but high performance of the ILSC in the last two years? Uh, I believe uh, regardless of those implications that the ILSC has continued to meet its uh, expectations of parliament. Do you genuinely, genuinely think that the ILSC is doing a good job? Uh, Senator, a subjective question, but I think at the end of the day, the IOSC is an important feature of uh, the Indigenous institutional framework in Australia, and I think it's got a very important role in the future. Uh, I do think that it can always strive to be better, and that's something that I'm very keen to continue working uh, across the other portfolios and within the IOSC. Thank you. I'm happy to be happy for this to go on uh, notice, Chair. <laughs> but uh, how much is the CEO paid, and how much is the chair paid? We'd like this to be provided on notice. The salaries of the CEO, the chair, any remuneration for all board members. Also, please provide to me the salaries of the chief operating officer, the director of programs, the group general counsel and the executive director of corporate, including anyone acting in those positions. I also want any bonuses paid to them and any allowances. And I want to know how much each one of these people took home every year for the last five years. That's on notice. And my final question is, is it the belief of the ILSC that it enjoys the confidence of the minister? Is it the belief of senior management of the ILSC, particularly the chair and the CEO, that it enjoys the confidence of the minister? I'd like to answer the questions about the confidence of the minister, and that is that um, each of the people you have identified and groups you've identified do have the confidence of the minister. Thank you. No further questions. Us. Thank you very much, um, Senator Thorpe. Uh, Senator Lyons. Online. Very much, Chair, and uh, sorry for my absence earlier. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm uh, calling in from the lands of the uh, Wijak people of the Noongar Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and I also pay my respects to any Elders who might be um, tuning into this broadcast this morning. Um, so I've got some questions, obviously, for the ILSC and particularly around um, caveats. Um, but first of all, I just want to check that um, generally the broad aims of the ILSC are to um, support and ensure that Aboriginal corporations prosper through um, their associations with the ILSC. Uh, that Correct. Uh, our our uh, major task is to acquire best interest in land and water assets and to assist, uh, Aboriginal corporations around the country with uh, the management of those assets. Thank you. Um, so I want to speak particularly about Dowreen Farm, but in doing so, uh, which is the property that the Bonshaws are um, managing. But in doing so, I also want to acknowledge um, the questions broadly um, are supported by Yalali Downs, who also has similar uh, interests and um, is interested in the responses. So are you aware of the multiple requests to lift caveats from Dowreen Farm Aboriginal Corporation? Yes, Senator. And how many requests would you have received to lift caveats from that property? Uh, the exact number uh, escapes me at the, at the moment, Senator, but I can take that on notice. Thank you. Um, and you will also note that um, on the 6th of October, I coordinated a meeting between um, your offices and Dowreen Management to discuss caveats and loans. Yes. 
So in terms of caveats, um, is there any reason um, why a loan wouldn't be granted and a caveat lifted? Uh, uh, I can answer one for you, Senator. Uh, about due diligence. Yes, so sorry. Act, you just sorry. You need to introduce yourself. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Tricia Strand, Chief Operating Officer, ILSE. Senator, uh, our due diligence when we give consideration to consenting to the lifting of a caveat is the risk to the property. So part of that mm -hmm. would be the uh, financial viability of the business. Uh, the um, capacity group to service the loan and whether there are any potential risks that the business or forfeiting of the loan would put somebody at risk of being lost from uh, indigenous So financial due diligence as well as capability and governance due diligence are all factors that would um, uh, determine whether the ILSC believe it would be a reasonable risk to lift a caveat for a mortgaging purpose. And in recent times, when um, Dowreen Farm Aboriginal Corporation have requested loans, um, you've agreed to those because you are satisfied that um, they have the ability to repay and that the risk, the risk is the normal risks are you're comfortable with. Is that correct? That's correct. And part of our uh, question on notice will. Um, the number of times and the events of which we've consented to pay it's to support down mortgaging. Yeah. And so given that um, you uh, have a lot of, uh, you know, you've divested a lot of land across Australia and um, uh, those properties run a range of businesses and so on and so forth. Um, Dowreen is a is a farm. It's predominantly a, a she, it runs sheep, and so it needs um, funds in a timely manner. So, how do you ensure that when um, Dowreen and properties similar to Dowreen apply for a loan, that you're able to do your processes um, in a timely manner to enable? Uh, Dowreen to use that money in in the way that it uh, in the in the reason it's applied for the loan. So let me give you an example. So uh, each year they want to they they want to build the the farm and and make the business more viable. And it is a property I've visited. It it is in a in a very uh, good part of Western Australia. So good rains and so on and so forth. But obviously. Um, in buying sheep, you have to have those funds available to get the best sheep that you're able to afford in a timely manner. So how do you make sure that um, those funds are available and that any potential caveats are lifted? I can just confirm the uh, lending wasn't an ILS activity. Uh, uh, Dowry secured a loan from uh, someone else. You're correct, mm -hmm. the ILSC's top and the manner in which we work with Dowry, but also the lender to marry up the lifting of cable to enable the um, approval of loan is uh, LSC responsibility. Yeah. Um, so how do you ensure Dowry. that that money is available in a timely manner, that you lift the caveats, that you do your due diligence? Yeah. So for Dowry, I can confirm the lender was a party that the ILSC was actually able to work with along with Dowry to marry up their due diligence and approval process with our consenting. Uh, I'll add it to our questions on notice, but I, from recollection, there was um, a, a process that Dowry, ILSC and the lender had to work through in terms of additional approval, their approval being additional upon the ILSC lifting the caveat and, and what happened and provide that detail for you. And, but, and you're also aware that as a result of your very slow processes that Dowreen was not able to purchase the sheep that it wanted to. And in fact, the loan was many months months late. And so Dowreen wasn't able to um, prosper in the way that your operational guidelines say that that's what you do. You're aware of that? I am, Senator. I'm aware of a differing view we have with Dowreen about the of events in terms of the processing 
consent, the, they're seeking of our consent to lift the caveat. We're well aware and have been working with Dowreen about um, laying that out. I'm not sure Dowreen would agree with that characterisation. Um, has an explanation been given to Dowreen on why that request was uh, the, that request for the lifting of the caveat took so long? Has that been given in writing? I and I take that on notice, Senator. Um, there's certainly been meetings and correspondence, but whether the IRA has um, been as is it with Dowreen that's needed around an explanation, I have to take that on. All right, so uh, could you take that on notice and could you provide that um, written explanation? Can do, Senator. Thank you. Um, and in terms of other properties and other requests, um, um, has um, have other caveats been lifted successfully in a, and in a timely manner? Senator, I can confirm that last financial ILSC received and approved five requests to lift caveats. Um, apologies, I don't know the details of the took us to approve that, but I can get that to you. But of all Thank five you. requested, five were granted. All right. And um, have you discussed the issue of seasonal financing when looking at um, the need for caveats to be lifted? Uh, we have, and part of our diligence, because um, we are of particularly groups like Dowreen that the um, operating uh, costs are the greatest and risk to them. And the last question is, um, does ILSC accept that Dowreen and Yulali Downs remain viable businesses? Yeah, have to take that on, uh, Senator. You, ha you, you have to take on notice whether or not they're viable businesses. Um, my, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any due diligence and assessment of Yulali Downs in Do you accept that Dowreen remains a viable business? If I, if I may, Sam, last time we, we looked at the arrangements and the finances for Dowreen at uh, a viable business, although marginal um, and so it was some time ago so we can't uh, comment currently. All right, so you'll, you'll take that on notice for both Dowrin and Yulali? Yes. Thank you. All right, thanks Chair, no further questions. Thank you very much Senator Lyons. Senator McMahon. Uh, yes, thank you uh, very much Chair and uh, thank you to, uh, to everyone for appearing today. Um, I just wish to, to go back to uh, estimates October uh, last year, where I asked uh, questions regarding um, former CEO, um, Mr. Michael Dillon being found by the Fair Work Ombudsman who deliberately acted dishonestly in the unfair dismissal of Mr. Alistair McCaffrey. Uh, Ms. Strata asked you that in the circumstances of Mr. Dillon having deliberately acted dishonestly, would you agree that the ILSC should reconsider reimbursing Mr McCaffrey his $105,000 legal fee when it was found at law that the ILSC was 100% at fault? Um, and I didn't really get an answer, well, I didn't get an answer to that, uh, except that, um, that Mr McCaffrey was paid his statutory entitlements. Um, can, can you tell me, uh, please, Ms Stroud, why Mr McCaffrey was not informed of the option to request reimbursement of his legal fees pursuant to the Legal Service Directions 2017 and its predecessor provision, the same way that it was offered and granted by the ILSC Board to ILSC CEO John Maher and Chair Eddie Fry in relation to the Ombudsman's investigation of their alleged bullying and harassment of staff? Senator, if you don't mind, we might call on uh, our group general counsel to answer that question. Uh, 
Good morning, Trevor Edmund Group, General Counsel of the ILSC. Uh, Senator, I take on notice that question because I'm not aware of any correspondence that may or may not have been provided to Mr McAllister at the time. Uh, the terms of the um, termination package negotiated. I am aware of the termination package as executed by both the ALC as within and Mr McCaffrey, uh, which confirmed that it was a payment, uh, the settlement payment was to all matters relating to uh, his employment, service, termination, and matters relating to the termination. Uh, as to whether there was any specific uh, correspondence to Mr McCaffrey, well, I would presume as uh, he had legal he had legal representation to his legislatives uh, as to the possibility of uh, an entitlement to payment of legal fees. I'm not aware of that, but I will undertake that investigation if I can and we will report back on notice. Um, yes, yes, please. If you could, if you could uh, provide an answer as to why he wasn't informed um, of the the option to request reimbursement of those legal fees, that uh, that would be good. Thank you. And Chair, I, I do have other questions, but in the interest of time, I'm happy to put them on notice. Thank you very much, Senator McMahon. Really appreciate that. Uh, if no other senators have questions for the ILSC, we will let them go. Thank you very much for appearing this morning. Uh, and I now welcome, hopefully via video conference, Mr Michael Borg, Chief Executive Officer and other officers of Outback Stores Proprietary Limited. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got myself and Jay Rato here, CFO from Outback Stores, and I um, probably just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, we're dialing in from Darwin this morning and um, to pay our respects to the elders past and present um, for the Larrakeer people here in Darwin. Um, Mr Borg, I might just interrupt you there and urge you to um, either move closer to your microphone if possible or raise your voice somewhat because we're having a little bit of difficulty hearing you in the committee room. We'll get um, our friends in broadcasting to ramp the sound up as best they can, but um, we'll try and uh, get as a bit more volume. No worries. Is that a bit louder? That's, that's a bit better, thank you, Mr Borg. Um, do you wish to make an opening statement? Um, we provided an opening statement uh, yesterday, so I hope everyone's got a copy of that. Um, but I will just note that um, we did we were represented four months ago um, at the last um, hearing, and um, um, since then um, it has been a challenging period for Outback Stores, and more specifically to, um, I guess, um, COVID-19 implications through communities in the Northern Territory as the, as the virus um, has, has hit those communities. And in addition to that, um, we've had a challenging time of it post Christmas from a flooding point of view as well. So it certainly made a challenging start to the, to the year, Chair. But uh, myself and Jay are happy to take questions from um, yourself and, um, and the Senators and, um, and hope we can answer them um, well enough for you today. Thank you very much, Mr Borg. And indeed, we have had that uh, opening statement circulated in paper form to the committee just now. So I thank the Secretariat for that. Um... Senator McCarthy, I believe I'm giving you the call. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning to all from Outback Stores. Thanks for joining us here this morning. Um, I, firstly, I'd like to just actually go to uh, uh, rapid antigen tests, if I may, Mr Borg, and just ask uh, how many tests rat tests have been available uh, throughout the Outback Stores network. Yeah, good morning, um, Senator. Um, nice to speak to you. Um, um, you know, we've, we feel that um, through the COVID pandemic, um, we've been ahead of the game um, on most fronts um, um, across the journey. Um, yes, it has been a bit testing um, over the last four months. Um, specifically in relation to um, testing, um, we were able to procure um, a significant amount of tests for our business um, well in, in advance. Um, and I, I, I note that um, from an Outback Stores point of view, for Outback Stores team members, um, at our support offices, and as well as and in our stores, um, there's, there's a suitable amount of um, rats available for, for all our team um, and the extended team. At times, um, we have heard that within communities that where we work in, 
um, that some supplies have been short from um, from clinics. Um, and um, but as far as outback stores goes, um, I believe we've, um, we've we've well managed that scenario um, over the recent months. So, Mr. Borg, are you able to put a number on how many rats for each of your stores? Um, yeah, I think we we um, um, procured about 800 rats um, in total, and, and we, we've been sending them out um, in in job lots to the stores for our store managers to use. So, I think we might have sent out 10 to our larger stores um, um, just before Christmas. And I know as late as yesterday, we had another batch come through with, with, with bundles of five um, and 10, which are going out to stores as well. So, I'm quite confident um, from, the, from the team members at store level, um, if they need to take a wrap um, at any time, um, they're available. Um, in addition to that, um, we've got a backup supply in our Darwin support office and our Alice Springs support office. And it's easy enough for us to move move that stock out to um, to stores if required. And what's your policy for employees with rats? Is there an expectation that they take one each morning before they start work, or only when they're feeling unwell? Yeah, probably, um, Senator. In line with the CHO directions, um, um, if someone's showing symptoms, um, we certainly make sure they have a rat test. And then behind behind that, um, Senator. We've got a few policies in place um, around how we manage certain circumstances um, if there is a positive test um, in community for one of our managers. And, and to date, across the 48 stores, um, we've had um, six management couples test positive. Um, and, and I would say an, an additional um, couple yesterday up in the Northern Territory. So I believe we've got good processes in place, um, good mitigation processes in place um, as we work through these challenging times. Okay, so you say six management couples have tested positive. So where were they? So let me just correct that. Three, it was three management couples, six, six team members um, in total. And where were they located? Um, with a couple in Papa, a couple in Papania, um, a couple on Bathurst Island, and we also had a couple that um, had come back from um, the Eastern Seaboard. Um, who didn't um, make it back into community. They were they tested positive en route back to community. Um, I think they're at Tenac Creek at the time. Okay, so so they would have stayed in Tenant, is that what you mean, Mr. Ball? Uh, they, I think they actually got transferred to the Todd facility in Alice Springs and um, were certainly well looked after. Yep, yep. And uh, with with Papania, and was it Bathurst Island, the other one you said? Sorry, I missed yes. the second one. Yeah, about the style where we manage the, the club out there, Senator. So do, where do they isolate in Papunya and Bathurst? Um, it's, we've been quite lucky, um, albeit we've got protocols in place for different scenarios. Um, in Bathurst, um, due to the, the, um, the, the outbreak on the islands, the club has been closed. Um, so they're lucky enough to be able to bunker down in their residence on the islands, as per many other community members, and, and work through the, the issues of the um, I guess of having the virus over a seven or eight day period. Okay, so so that's your staff arrangement. Have you been selling rats in 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 the outback stores? Um, we have tried to procure some stock. I believe we may have had some minimal stock, um, but it has been challenging, Senator. We we are fine. Is that a we yes? Or <laughs> is that a yes to selling selling in the stores, Mr. Boyle? I'll probably class it as a no, um, but but at times we have we have had some some stock, and where we've had additional stock and the community needs it, um, we've, we've also um, um, certainly helped out. What we're finding, um, Senator, is in communities, um, and I think we've got um, 18 communities across Northern Territory and South Australia currently um, where the virus is is impacting. Um, we've got a great set of stakeholders outside of outback stores who all work together. Um, to come up with solutions um, to help the, to each specific community. So, so is that a policy about back stores not to sell rats then? No, it's not. Um, it's, uh, it's certainly a procurement piece that we're still working through. Our priority has been our staff and the team members um, that we work with. Um, and um, for the most, Senator, um, um, the government um, authorities in the districts that we work in have been supplying rat tests through the health clinics. Um, and, and there may be a couple of examples where um, supply may have been short in those areas. But in general, um, 
Um, I haven't had too much feedback where there haven't been um, rat tests available um, for community members. Okay, so so basically, if people come in to ask for rats, thinking you may be selling it, your staff would just say there are no rats for sale. Um, there's no rats for sale, um, um, but you know um, what we're finding is um, the communities are, are well engaged um, with the clinics. Um, on a couple of occasions where there, there is no clinic, um, we've had rats dropped off at store level um, for communities. So I know at a mumper down um, in Central Australia, um, there's no um, permanent medical clinic there. So we're more than happy to um, look after the rat tests and give them out to community when required. So then you would just give them freely, would you? Absolutely. Well, why is that, Mr. Ball? Why, why is that important to our back stores? It's all about, um, as, a, as a stakeholder in, in a community, um, working together through these challenging times. So um, each community is different. Um, each community has got, you know, um, you know different um, amount from a population point of view. And um, what we're finding is when um, an outbreak hits a community, um, all the stakeholders um, get together and work out best case solutions, um, you know, specific to that individual community. So if there's no medical clinic, um, certainly address what's happening from a rat point of view. If there's no policing, we work out what policing is um, in, a, in a town which is close. And depending on the size of the outbreak, outbreak um, the stakeholders decide on the best actions. Outback stores from a store point, point of view has a, um, a list of mitigation tasks um, for when there is an outbreak in the community to keep our staff and our, our store team safe because we know the importance of making sure that store stays open um, through, the, through the, uh, the outbreak in the community. We are finding a, a fairly good level of collaboration on the ground in community centre. So when you procured your rats, you said you had around 800 rats in total. Um, where do you procure them from? We've been procuring them locally um, through a pharmacy in Darwin. And has the federal government offered you any rats to Outback stores? Um, they haven't, but we haven't asked either, Senator. Um, we, we are quite self-sufficient and um, we are quite well connected up here in Darwin. If I believed I had a need um, for assistance in that space, I, I would certainly go to um, NIA and, and have those discussions and, and work out a solution, or I would um, work with uh, the critical goods team out of the Northern Territory and, and try and have the matter addressed. Can I just turn to um, the recent uh, disruptions as a result of the roads cut uh, and the rail line cut into the Northern Territory with the rains in South Australia? Has that had an impact on our back stores, especially here in the Northern Territory? You've got 27 stores. Yeah, it has been a challenging period. Um, and I, I know that um, your office is reaching out for some information um, from us and, um, and, and, and you guys do a great job of trying to collaborate um, with some of those issues. Um, we probably, um, you've got to break it down to two scenarios. Uh, we had the Stewart Highway um, broken um, you know, down below Alice Springs. Um, which, which is one issue. And then we had excessive rainfall um, in the central desert, um, which created localised flooding. So um, the, the main uh, route out of Adelaide, um, whilst um, there was a lot of attention in the media, um, we actually weren't impacted by that component too much. Um, we drew a lot of stock out of our Alice Springs and Darwin distribution centres, who, who are well stocked. Um, we had some supply issues uh, with fresh produce, um, but, um, you know, like we do um, when we, we are challenged, um, we, we certainly work on a, uh, how to mitigate that fairly quickly. So fresh produce was moved through an alternative route uh, up through the Barclay and around. And um, I feel that we didn't miss the beat um, from, from the point of view of the main highway cut um, down in South Australia. Where it became really challenging was um, the unusual amount of rainfall um, in the Alice Springs district. And, and, and um, you know, we have 17 stores in that district I think all but four um, stores were heavily impacted by localised flooding. So um, it, it was a little bit challenging and um, we were stretched in, in some areas. Um, I, I think that specifically um, we had Papunya, Mount Liebig, Canteen Creek, um, Wallara and Wettinger all having to have um, air, air freight um, to support those stores. 
Uh, and um, as the roads start to open up, um, we did use some alternative transport. So as roads open up, um, you get given the option to um, where there is a four and a half tonne limit on some roads. Um, so we, we utilise you know, other, I guess, forms of transport to get stock into those stores. In general, Senator, I, I believe um, um, we were lucky that the rain um, dried up fairly quickly um, and um, collaboratively um, with the NT government um, and ourselves, um, we, we, we probably did okay. You know, we were short on some fresh produce and some perishable items in some stores, but in general, we're, we're pretty good. And as, as late of today, um, I, I think that the last couple of our major routes, and I, I refer to the road through Kintour um, off of the Tanami, um, we've got the, the last of, um, I guess, four trucks getting into those stores. So um, we believe we're back on track um, and uh, we look forward to the next fortnight with a top up load of those stores. Um, outside of that, Senator, um, we, are, we are still challenged um, up, in, up in the north west of Australia. Um, we have got some stores isolated, um, but again, a little bit like um, Alpa, who work in this district, um, the wet season stores um, are, do have significant stock builds um, for the wet season. Um, and we are utilising the West Australian Government at the moment to air freight stock into Younger, Nora, Mullen and Ringus. And Ringus, so we're permanently cut off at the moment. All right. Mr Borgo, I'm conscious of my time in questioning, so I will hand you back to the Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator McCarthy. If we have no other Senators seeking the call for outback stores, we will let you go. And thank you very much for appearing for the committee today. Um, and we now move swiftly on to the Northern Land Council, who I think we have via video conference. Um, I welcome Mr Joe martin Jard, Chief Executive Officer and other officers of the Northern Land Council. Mr martin Jard, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, no, no opening statement, but also want to acknowledge um, the Chairman of the Northern Land Council, um, Samuel bush Banazi, is in the room with us. Thank you very much. You. Um, and as per the previous witnesses, if we can try and speak as closely to the microphone in your room as possible, um, because the, we're having a few volume issues here in the committee room. I'm going to give the call to Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, <coughs> Chair. Um, thank you, uh, gentlemen, I thank all, uh, for appearing today. Um, look, I just have some questions about the um, uh, Indigenous economic stimulus uh, package. Um, I think that was announced in November 2020. Um, can I ask um, uh, uh, how how many have you? I think you have um, issued some funding for that. How much funding have you approved from the NLC to how many projects? Um, yes, Senator Canavan, if you don't mind, I'd just like to say a few words before we turn to that detail okay. and don't. Is that just, in, is, just a sec? Is, just, is that in response to my question, or is this an opening statement, or just so we know where we are? I just want to acknowledge the support that we've gotten from um, Minister Wyatt. It, uh, it's, it, it's been extraordinary and uh, you know, most welcome. It saved um, quite a few businesses up here and, and jobs, and um, and plus the ad station support we've got. So. Sorry about that indulgence. Uh, I'll get um, our chief financial officer to address your question. Okay. Uh, Ivan Blunt, chief financial officer, Northern Land Council. Uh, thanks, Senator, for your question. So yes, we did indeed uh, received funding uh, uh, from uh, the National Energy Sustaining Agency in November 2020. The Minister for Indigenous Australia and the Honourable Ken White Chair AM approved announced the 100 million uh, and the Indigenous Economic Stimulus Package. So out of that, NLC has been allocated 36.7 million delivered over two financial years, with 22 million in 2021 and 14.7 million in 2122. Um, all of that 22 million in trench one, we received 75 funding applications and we have already approved 71 out of those 75 applications and four are still under process. 
Uh, and we uh, we have al already allocated 20.7 million out of that 22 million received in trench one. Trench two, we have received 100 application asking for almost three times more funding than the available uh, funding of 14.7 million. So we received uh, 100 application requesting 39.4 million compared to 14.7 million available, which was oversubscribed by about 268 percent. Uh, we are still going through the process of allocating that funding. Uh, so far, uh, the decision has been made to approve about 12.1 million out of that 14.7 million we received, but we are working with those recipients. Um, and we are working through a process of how these funds will be managed. Okay. The, 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 just returning to the tranche one, you, you've, I think if I heard you correctly, 75 applications receive, uh, receive for funding, 71 approved, and you've got four in train. So you won't actually reject any applications from tranche one? Is that the intention at least, if those other four get approved? Uh, there, there were there were a few uh, senators which were being rejected. So these seventy five funding applications are the, those ones which were being shortlisted. Okay. Uh, and uh, seventy one of those have already been approved, right. okay. and we have uh, so. shortlisted. Okay. How many app do you know? How many applications you receive those then? Um, I, I, you can take uh, that on notice if you like. If you could take that on notice, and uh, and, yes. and and so. Was the, what was the criteria to determine which projects got shortlisted? Were there some guidelines um, mm -hmm. that you assessed against them against? Uh, yes, yes, Senator, indeed. Uh, um, actually, the Minister for Indigenous Australia, um, when he wrote all the four land councils back in November 2020, he also mentioned some principles which were set up by the ministers. Uh, and uh, I, can, I can read the principles called to you. Well, as long as they're brief, um, as long as they we obviously have yeah, limited time. Five principles in total. I won't go into the details of those principles. I've, I've, principles got, I've got your annual report here, and, and there's five points in your annual report. Is that, are they the ones yes. that you're referring to? Okay, yes, well, they're I've, there. I've got them in front of me. Were there any, was there a, I was really asking, was there a broader set of guidelines, though, that establish certain probity requirements, um, dates that, pro that submissions have to be in, that sort, of, that sort of administrative detail. Was that at all established or was it just these five points? Uh, uh, no, no, Senator. Uh, there was a guideline, a very detailed guideline, okay. outlining the requirements for the applications. Yep. And there was the set dates when the applications were open, when the applications were closed. I don't have those guidelines. Could you take on notice and, and provide those to the committee? Uh, uh, yes. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to turn to a particular um, grant. Uh, well, actually, before I do that, the, the actual process, uh, um, what, did, what was established to assess the applications? Was there a, a subcommittee of your organisation or, or did it go to the board? What, what, who, who were involved in approving them and how did that happen? Uh, so there were two processes, uh, Senator. So for the trench one, we were assessing the applications by the senior uh, NLC staff member. So, uh, so, just so we you just broke up there. Sorry, was that a CEO and staff member and a staff member? Senior, senior staff member in NLC Northern Land Council. So senior staff member of Northern Land Council assessed those application first, based on the principles, ensuring the, 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 the applications meet the principles set by the minister and also the criteria established by the Northern Land Council. So there was a set criteria uh, which the applications must meet before we uh, send our assessment to the CEO for the final decision. So final decision maker is the CEO of the Northern Land Council, but the applications were assessed by the senior staff of Northern Land Council. And the, the criteria which we followed was investment principle and need. How well does the project align with the investment principle set by the minister? And what was the need for that funding request? Okay. Value for money, capacity to deliver, whole of life costs, and measurable outcomes. Okay. So these are the criteria which we uh, Okay, Th thanks for that. I just wanted to repeat back so I got that and, and the line was pretty good but a little scratchy. So you had senior staff evaluate the 
the applications. They were shortlisted by them and that shortlist was, um, was ultimately provided to the CEO and the CEO had the final and individual decision. Is that, is that a correct summary? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as I say, I just wanted to turn to, to a particular grant uh, provided to Sunrise Health. Um, and uh, I've got here, you, you, I don't believe this would be the full list of 71 approved, but you have provided to the Senate a list of contracts for last year, for 2021, and there's roughly 50 going to the Indigenous Economic Stimulus Package there. There's one here to Sunrise Health. Um, that is a grant of almost $1.1 million. Uh, is that correct? Am I correct there about that the, a grant being provided to Sunrise Health through the uh, Yes. Economy? Yes, Senator, $1 million was provided exclusively of GST. Okay. And so that grant, it says here in that table, the start was the 3rd of August. Can you tell me when that was approved? Uh, Senator, I don't have the date in front of me when that was approved, uh, um, but we do have the actual amount uh, uh, which was approved, and I also can uh, tell the Senator if, if it's okay with you the outcome of that grant, so why, we, why we have approved uh, that funding for Sunrise. So that was pretty bad to maintain the level of care for patients with chronic disease and avoid attracting COVID-19 infection. So that request came from uh, Sunrise, and we assessed the application. Uh, uh, we met the criteria, and then um, it was approved by the CEO of the Northern Ireland Council. Uh, I can take that on notice, the date, and other details, and we can provide you. Take so, okay. when that was approved. So, just to be clear, was that that Sunrise Health was shortlisted by the staff in the list that went to the CEO? Uh, yes. 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 Okay. Senator. All right. Um, uh, can I ask, um, uh, and that, the, and the decision to fund Sunrise Health, that was made by the CEO? That was uh, as per the normal yeah, process yeah. as you outlined? Yes, Senator. Okay. Do you, were, um, uh, were any conflicts of interest disclosed associated with the, deliver, the grant to Sunrise Health? Um, I, I, I can't recall the conflicts, uh, Senator, and I think the decision maker was the CEO of the Netherlands Council, and I don't think there was any conflict between the CEO and the, uh, uh, and the Sunrise. Okay, so you so, don't believe, you don't believe, look, you could take on notice if you like, just to confirm that if you can. Um, I, I, I just, I know you couldn't confirm the date, but I noticed in your annual report that uh, 55 grants had been approved before the 30th of June last year. Was this one of those 55? Um, just, I, I don't think, Senator, but uh, I can take that on notice okay. as well. I, okay. don't believe, I don't believe so. All right, okay. Um, well, what I'm really wanting to know, if you could take on notice, was the CEO, Miss Marion Scrim Scrimmager, at the time that grant was approved? I'll take that on notice. Then. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I, I um, just one thing that just jumps out at me though about this grant um, was that it's a little different from everything else. As, you, as you'd appreciate, those those um, five points you mentioned earlier in your annual report refer to to infrastructure and 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 jobs and linking with with industry. Um, and most of the other grants look in that category, but this seems to be of the 50 odd in this list that you've submitted to the Senate, it's the only one going to a health service. What was this grant exactly for? Uh, as, as I outlined the uh, Senator, the outcome was to maintain the level of care for patients uh, with chronic disease and what are affecting COVID-19 infections. So, during this period, uh, also we do, do we do have the principles, uh, five principles set up by the minister, but we also look at other factors when we decide whether we should recommend this grant for approval or not. And when we look at the overall grant application, we believe that there were merits in approving that grant for health rights. Sunrise, sorry. So it was primarily to provide health services to Indigenous Australians. Is that is that what I'm hearing? 
Uh, yes, and also to avoid the COVID-19, which was really, uh, as you guys will appreciate that, uh, uh, in Kashmir there was one stage when they were in the lockdowns, uh, and it's still uh, one of the issues there. So, uh, so that, that consideration was given when approving this grant as well. Can you just explain to me how, uh, notwithstanding the importance of COVID-19, how, how did that issue meet, which one of the five points did that meet? I, I'm struggling to see how that would have fitted fit into the to the guidelines here set by the minister, the principles, the investment principles, I should say, set by the minister. Um, as I explained earlier, uh, Senator, that uh, in this particular grant we can we can take it on notice and provide okay. the full details, but uh, okay. um, certain things because this is a the question relates to the one particular uh, indigenous organisation, and we prefer to take it on notice if it's okay to to respond back. Okay, if you could. Um take that on notice. That would be great. Um, all right. Thank you very much for that, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Canavan. Senator McMahon. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, my my questions relate, they're of a similar nature to, uh, to Senator Canavan, um, and they relate to the, um, the economic stimulus money out of the um, Aboriginal benefit account. Um, now, as at uh, Senate estimates last year in October, uh, there had been $54.2 million expended of, uh, of that money. Uh, this was that information was provided um, as per questions that I asked. Now, um, and, a, and a, a slight breakdown was given of what that money was spent on. What I'm going to ask for is a much more detailed breakdown um, of what that money was spent on. Um, and now we've got uh, $24 million on infrastructure, um, $5.9 million on tourism economic stimulus, $270,000 on training and skills development economic stimulus, uh, 2049 on agricultural economic stimulus, uh, 84 on homeland communities, 7.1 on employment, um, 2.5 on economic development, um, and 1.03 on arts and culture. Um, now, uh, for each of those figures, I'd like to know how much of that was through the Northern Land Council, how each of those, those fundings, grants or amounts uh, how were they authorised and by whom and the process for this authorisation? Uh, who or what were the entities or persons receiving that funding? So a breakdown of each, um, each entity or person receiving that funding and how much was given to each entity or person and what is the economic, what is the anticipated outcome of each of the funded entities or persons and how are they being measured? So I realise that's a, a lot of detailed information that I'm asking for. Um, so if you're not able to table that um, right this very minute, um, you know, I'm happy for you to, to take that on notice and get back to me. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Senator, for the question. and. Uh... We believe that we have already responded to those questions. Uh, they were being uh, forwarded by the agency to Northern Land Council, and we responded back on 1st of February 2022. So those, those questions with those details have already been responding back to the agency centre. I, I don't believe that the responses were detailed, and I don't believe that they covered um, each of my questions yeah. that I've just run through there. Um, so I would ask you to, and I'm, I'm happy to put these to you in writing if, if that helps, because I do realise I had quite a lot of questions with a lot of detail, but I don't believe that they have been answered. So I would ask you to have a look at my questions and come back to me with that level of detail. Uh, thanks, Senator. We, uh, we would like to take that on notice and uh, we'll come back. Yes, yes, I'm happy for that. Thanks. So what, what um, 
the person who was answering the questions, I didn't catch, um, catch his name. I think he said that information was provided earlier this month, but I assume, um, Ms Brown, that that's information provided to the NIAA, not to the committee, um, that there's some accountability process there or? Okay, oh, well, uh, we'll, 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 leave, we'll leave that question to unnoticed. Mm -hmm. I didn't, uh, just thought it might have been provided separately. It's a bit I'm confused sure we'll about get the responses work. somewhere yep. or another, Senator Ayres. Um, I think I'm giving the call to Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got some questions which probably straddle the NLC and the CLC, and I know that the CLC are coming a bit later, but I might be a bit repetitive in relation to the questions. I think it might be worth um, saying to the CLC that if you can hear us, take very uh, close attention to what Senator Dodson is asking, because you may be asked the same thing very shortly. That's right, and I'd expect far greater erudite answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman and your team there at the Northern Land Council. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can, I think I can see you in a little box across from me. Um, I wanted to ask you, in, in estimates on Tuesday, the Australian Electoral Commission discussed its engagement with the Land Councils on COVID uh, safe measures uh, that can be put in place to enable remote voting in the coming elections. How are these discussions uh, being progressed from your perspective? Good yeah. We, um, uh, Senator Joe Martin, uh, CEO of Northern Land Council here, um, just in case you can't see me. It, it, um, we, we really haven't had any meaningful engagement with the Australian Youth Electoral Commission. Um, so there's really not a you know, great deal to say, I'm afraid. So from your, your knowledge of the geographical domain you cover and the complexities of the world you live in today with uh, the biosecurity Act and the questions of movement. Um, will, will the Australian Electoral Commission be able to enter communities and to conduct mobile voting uh, if these biosecurity zones remain? Yes, they will. Um, uh, we're expecting the biosecurity zones to be um, lifted in uh, a couple of weeks um, and um, but they're still designated as essential um, activities according to the Chief Health Operator's directions in the Northern Territory. So you're saying that, that these are likely to be lifted in a few weeks' time and that the activities of the AEC could be resumed on these lands? Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, in a COVID safe way, we know that the AEC has pretty good COVID management plans and uh, they're quite detailed. Uh, it includes things like wearing masks and using hand sanitizers and social distancing and all the other things that you would expect to see. Um, so the, we think um, it, it'll be fine um, after the your biosecurity zones are lifted in two weeks. So have you got any undertakings from the AEC when they might begin any enrolment uh, processes for people on these remote communities? No, Senator. And is there any indication of where the polling, the mobile polling booths might be? No, Senator. So you really don't know whether they're going to be able to get there? Mm. Um, yeah, it calls for some speculation. But we really don't know. So, what what efforts is the land council itself making to bring to the attention of the First Nations peoples living in this remote part of Australia that there's a pending election coming? They need to check that they're on the roll, and if not, get on the roll and ensure that they turn up to vote for whomever they wish when the polling. Booths open. 
we've been quite active um, in that space, uh, especially when it came to the. There was a bill at some stage proposed to, around you know voter ID that we um, thought would be yet detrimental to the yet democratic rights of Aboriginal people living in remote areas, and uh, we. Um, advocated against that bill uh, because of it being unfair. And um, so, but at the same time, while we were you know, consulting with um, people in Arnhem Land and other places, for example, we were raising um, the prospect of an um, election this year and the importance of getting on the roll and voting. So we've been quite active in, in, in doing that. Do, have you had any discussions with the uh, AEC, AEC if there isn't any capacity to access the community? In some places in the eastern states have mailed voting ballots out to people who've got it a postal box, but I know that many there don't have them, so how will this work? Um. I'm not sure. Look, the AEC may have already been in touch with the Northern Land Council and I just may not be aware of if they're talking to um, our officers who work in the permits area and so on. Uh, but um, how will it work? Like it's worked in the past um, decades, um, they have the remote polling booths, for example. Um, but um, uh, and plus, they do do a lot of um, information in languages these days, and um, so I guess that they're gearing up for a uh, an advertising campaign and a you know promotions campaign. All right. If I can go to just another area, which is the COVID uh, pandemic a matter that I know is devastating many of your communities. Uh, as well as in Central Australia. But uh, what um, support is the NLC uh, providing to the communities in your region in the, in the face of this pandemic? We moved quickly, uh, the your chairman who's here with us today moved quickly to suspend uh, permits for you know, recreation purposes. We were really trying to uh, prevent people from um, south and overseas going to communities who may have been infected with COVID. So we moved quickly there. We also lobbied to have a reintroduction of the biosecurity zones um, up here. Uh, we were reacting to um, um, calls from senior community leaders who, you know, uh, you know traditional owners who were asking for um, lockdown and um, or lockout. So we were using all of the resources that we had available to us uh, um, to fight the pandemic. In fact, it's been all consuming, I've got to say. So in, do you, um, in, in your region, is there enough rat tests and PPE equipment being provided by the Commonwealth to those communities? We are aware that as recently as only a week ago, the answer to that question was uh, no, there weren't enough uh, equipment. But what we're hearing in the last couple of days, though, is that um, rat kits have been um, uh, sent out to uh, you know the independent Aboriginal medical services um, that you're familiar with, and um, those kits are. Uh, now hitting the ground, but it's been a long time coming in. It really, um, the absence of that equipment and PPE and um, and even our surge work teams workforce um, really played havoc. And um, we we kept COVID out of remote areas for you know two years, but um, now sadly uh, it's it's with us and. Um, I think, um, you know, you know, really tragically, there's been um, over 10 deaths and the most of those deaths, as you know, are senior Aboriginal people who 
um, you know, tragically have died from COVID. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Dodson. Thank you, uh, Northern Land Council. Um, Senator Canavan just has a couple of follow-up questions, and then we'll bring on CLC and go back to Senator just, Dodson. Just very quickly, um, just returning back to the uh, the grant to Sunrise Health, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there doesn't seem to be any other grants to health services. Are you aware of any other Aboriginal health services receiving a grant under the Indigenous Economic Stimulus Package from the Northern Land Council? Uh, sorry, Senator, any of them have Sorry. The question was, do, have we supported any other health organisation yes. in the uh, the, the, only, uh, the only one uh, which we received the application was from Sunrise uh, Senator, so we, uh, I don't believe we received any other applications. Okay, okay, so yep. Um, perhaps you could take that on notice just to confirm if you can, if that's okay, that, that whether you received any applications from other health services and or whether, of course, you approved any funding to health services. Um, and just finally, um, um, did you, did the NLC uh, um, put out a call for applications at any point in time for this, this program? Uh, yes, Senator, uh, we did. Um, and uh, I, can, I can provide those dates uh, uh, to you as well. Um, so, I, so we opened up the trench two applications on 20th of September, 21, and then we closed the round two on 20th of October. And after that, our process commenced on the 1st of November, and the assessment finished from the panel on 2nd of December, and then um, we provided those recommendations to the Northern Did, CEO. Did you, you, did you send the uh, request or send the information about the package to all health services in your in the Northern Land Council areas? Well, all uh, Aboriginal so health we, services, I should say. So Senator, the process while well, the loan was open, so it was published on our website that the loan is open, and also we sent to our regional offices the information in our region. So we, we haven't sent information to any particular health centre or any okay. Okay. because it was online. And, and just finally, I know I'm getting the wind up, and finally, uh, uh, when did Miss Marion Scrimmager resign as CEO? Uh, was it April? Um, I think it was April, Senator. Okay, April 2021, we're, we're, we're saying here. And, and I, I, can, I can confirm one question, Senator, that the Okay, but if you could still take on notice when it was approved, if you could, could you take on notice when it, when the sunrise? I mean, I, I know that's been on notice, but just so we're clear, I still want to know when the sunrise health decision was approved. Um, yep. Can I also ask when was the short list of applications sent to the CEO for that trench yes, one? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Canavan, and thank you to the Northern Land Council for appearing today. Um, we'll now move thank on you. to the Central Land Council, and I welcome by video conference Mr Leslie Turner, Chief Executive Officer and other officers of the Central Land Council. Mr Turner, um, in the interests of time, I might ask that if you have an opening statement that it be tabled for the committee because we are running a little behind. Uh, there was a break in communications there, Chairman. Um, let's turn it from the Central Land Council. No, we don't have an opening statement. Very good, thank you. Um, I will give the call to Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, uh, g'day, Les. I'm not sure whether you heard the questions I put to the NLC, but I'll uh, go back to them. In the estimates yes, on Tuesday, uh, the AEC, the Electoral Commission, discussed its engagement with the land councils on COVID uh, safe measures that will be put into place to enable remote voting in the coming election. Um, how have these discussions been uh, progressed from your perspective? Uh, thank you, Senator Dotton, for the question. Les Turner, the CEO of the Central Land Council. 
We've been liaising with the Australian Electoral Commission in Darwin, the Northern Territory Engagement Officer. We're having a meeting here in Alice Springs with him and our executive. And in terms of electoral officers being out in communities, they're considered uh, essential workers under the Chief Health Officer's directions. And in terms of us uh, promoting the elections in our land rights news over the last two editions, and the chairman's letter will go in the edition which comes out next week, um, encouraging Aboriginal people to get enrolled and to vote. And uh, most of the information on our, our elections for the Central Land Council is happening. Information is going out and our meeting is scheduled for April at Lake Nash. Okay, so do, do you have any uh, concerns about the biosecurity uh, zones remaining and the Electoral Commission being able to perform or not perform their role in enrolling people and secondly in conducting the uh, polling booths? Uh, Senator Dodson, the biosecurity measures lifted last night for Central Australia and the Tiwi Islands and under the Chief Health Officer's directions, they're considered essential workers, any government workers, so we don't see a problem in that. Okay, so what is the Central Land Council, uh, I've heard what you said about alerting people to a pending election, but is the, the encouragement to get people on the rolls and to turn up uh, at these polling booths? That's what we're promoting, Senator, yes. Thank you. Um, my, my other questions go to the COVID matters as a couple. And how is the CLC supporting your communities uh, with the COVID pandemic? Uh, thank you, Senator. The Central Land Council has been working with the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress and also the Northern Territory Department of Health Central Region in terms of vaccination clinics in terms of support, um, barbecues, community events. We've also recently been supplying tents and blankets and that in for communities which will actually go out today, subject to some clearance of uh, under the Ch Chief Health Officer's orders, but we'll be supplying tents and blankets and isolation uh, equipment for a number of communities in Central Australia. Um, there's about nine, 10 main communities where we'll be providing that uh, support for isolation facilities in communities. And what about the supply of uh, rat testing packs and PPE equipment? Uh, that's uh, part of it. The Northern Territory and Commonwealth Government advised us that 100,000 was available last week coming to the Northern Territory and another 100,000 this week. And also in terms of the oral treatment tablets were here last Monday, um, and which is good in terms of addressing the immediate uh, positive cases. Um, in terms of rat tests, the Central Land Council, we've been able to acquire through pharmacies and online, and also through one of our corporate partners, Newmont Mines, who supplied 2,100 uh, test kits to Central Australian Aboriginal Congress. Okay, thank you, Mr Turner, and thank you, Central Land Council. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Senator Dodson. Uh, Senator McMahon, I understood, had some questions for Central Land Council as well, if she's still on the line. Thank you. Yes, yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm not sure if you heard my question to the, the NLC. Um, this is basically the, uh, the exact same question to the um, CLC. Did, uh, were you aware of, did you hear that question or would you like me to repeat it? Oh, thank you, Senator. If you could repeat it for us, please. Yep, certainly. So um, as of October 31st last year, there'd been approximately $54.2 million spent on the economic stimulus from the Aboriginal Benefits Account. 
um, what I wanted to know, and there was, um, I've got a breakdown of figures that, that came out of last estimates, uh, 5.9 million on tourism, um, 24.3 million on infrastructure, uh, 2 million on um, agriculture, uh, 8.4 million on homeland communities, 7.1 million on employment, uh, 1.03 million on arts and culture, uh, 2.5 million on economic development, and 270,000 on training and skills development. And now what I would like to know is for each of those areas, a breakdown on how each funding grant or amount um, under those areas was authorised, by whom, whom it was authorised, and the process for the authorisation, and who or what were the entities or people receiving each of the funding amounts, how much was given to each of those uh, people or entities, and what is the anticipated outcome of each of the funded um, entities or activities, and how is this being measured? So um, again, I realise that's uh, quite a lot to be asking. It's asking for a lot of, um, of great detail. Um, so you know, if you're not able to table that um, here today, I'm happy for you to take it on notice. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Senator, for your question. We do have all that information available, and we're happy to take it on notice and send all the information down to the committee. Thank and, in, you. and in terms Thank of the the money, um, the Central Land Council received 36.7 million, and uh, we started processing them in March. As of 31 December, 17.1 stimulus funding has been approved. 1.9 million stimulus funding has been expended, and we have proposals worth 14 million, which are in development with us, and we got 5.6 million stimulus funding remaining, which is unattributed at this stage. And our process we go through is we promoted the, the program through our uh, regions, through our economic development unit. We, the, the, the criteria for assessments was developed in consultation with NIA in terms of the um, assessment criteria, the EPU receives applications does an assessment against criteria. And in terms of the assessment, it's through the EPU unit, unit, then our chief finance officer, general manager, and then to the CEO who has the delegation. Anything over a million dollars, we send down to the minister, but recent changes to the, the act, it's now uh, approval up to $5 million at the local level. Okay, so um, up to $5 million would be approved by the CEO, is that correct? Yes, under the new changes to the uh, Northern Territory uh, Aboriginal Investment Corporation amendments that went through. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, look, if you, have, if you have or are able to provide um, that very detailed breakdown, I will put, um, I will put that question uh, to you through the, the committee in writing so that you can respond to it. So uh, thank you and thank you, Chair. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator McMahon. I don't believe any other senators have questions for the Central Land Council. So we will send you off with our thanks for appearing today. Um, and we are six minutes away from our scheduled break, so I am going to call on Aboriginal Hostels Limited and we will try and deal with you as quickly as possible. And then we have caught up all of the time for this morning, which makes me very happy. Top shelf, too. Yeah. <laughs> Top shelf, something positive. <laughs> I welcome Mr. Dave Chalmers, Chief Executive Officer and other officers of the Aboriginal Hostels Limited organisation. Mr. Chalmers, I note that you have tabled an opening statement, and I think in the interest of time, we will take that as written, um, and I understand Senator McCarthy has some questions for you. Thank you, Chair. Um, to go to uh, the Aboriginal Hostels 
total revenue from the Commonwealth Government, uh, Mr Chalmer, in the period ending June 2021, it was nearly $36 million. Is that right? Uh, Senator Dave Chalmers, Chief Executive Officer of Aboriginal Hostels Limited. Uh, that's approximately correct, yes. OK, and how much funding has been allocated for this financial year? Uh, Senator, I don't have the figure in front of me. My chief financial officer might, but it's approximately the same amount. OK. Uh, and I understand as part of its COVID management plan, Aboriginal Hostels has reduced bed availability. So, so how many beds have been reduced as of today? Uh, Senator, uh, 148 beds have been taken offline. Um, Usually that's uh, one or two beds uh, in each hostel. In some hostels it's uh, as many as 10 or 12, but it depends how many beds the hostel has at a total and the layout of beds. Can you just uh, tell me which ones, which hostels have had 10 removed? Sorry, Senator, I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, are you asking which hostels have had beds removed from them? Had the 10 removed from them? Um, Wankatakari and Tennant Creek has had 10. Um, Apamari Visitor Park in Alice Springs has had 15. Uh, Yumba in Brisbane has had 12. Um, Mackay has had 10. Uh, William T. Onis in Melbourne, 19. And uh, Kabajai Baru in Derby has had 14. So why have they been larger numbers in those um Senator, it very much depends on the uh, layout of the hostel and uh, where we're trying to ensure that we don't have situations where, uh, uh, where we can't manage uh, a COVID outbreak in the hostel. OK, so if I can just go to Tennant Creek, you've had 10 beds removed from there. When were they removed? Uh, would have been 12 months ago, Senator, but I might ask uh, Mr Bob Harvey, our General Manager Operations, uh, to answer that question. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Bob Harvey, uh, General Manager Operations. Senator, we respond to the COVID demands in each uh, location across Australia. Uh, initially, when uh, COVID started, and we look back two years ago, we looked in particular and implemented COVID management plans. And in regard to Tennant Creek, um, that would have been an earlier decision in terms of, as uh, uh, Dave Chalmers said, in response to our capacity to handle within a room, we um, did take beds offline basically to ensure social distancing uh, and we've kept them offline. We adjust them in terms of lifting of uh, uh, requirements in different states, but uh, we adjust as required in, direction, in, in, in directions far from public health authorities. And is that the case with Alice Springs? When was Alice Springs taken offline? Uh, the same response as well, uh, Senator, in response to uh, directions and also in response to our own COVID management plans. So we made an assessment of all of our hostels in terms of our capacity to deal with COVID. And we do also adjust on the basis of the surrounding uh, issues associated with COVID. So was the Alice Springs one taken off 12 months ahead of like the Turner Creek? Uh, that's right, Senator. We did it across the board. OK, so how many beds are in Turner Creek now? At the moment? Yeah. Uh, if we look at Tannen Creek, um, and it depends which one you're looking at in Tannen Creek, but uh, I bring you um, at the moment, just bear with me, Senator. I bring you has uh, a four offline. Uh, the visitor centre has 12 offline. And we have one offline in uh, Allier. So, as you'd see, Senator, it depends a lot on um, the issues that are associated with dif the different hostels. 
Okay, so you've told me you've told me what Sorry, that's more than 10, though. That's more than 10 beds from Tanner Creek. Um, and which... Taken which, off. Um, so if I'm looking at one Kanakari, where you... So Alpinia is in Alice Springs and so is the visitor centre. So I think you've probably combined the two, is that right? Sorry, I've missed that question, Senator. Um, you've named two hostels which are actually in Alice Springs. Can I just ask you to go tell us about Tennant Creek? Tennant Creek, sorry, yes. Apologies, Senator. So, Senator, when can a car at Tennant Creek has 10 beds taken uh, offline? So, how many beds are there in Tennant Creek now available? Now, Mr Harvey will know for certain, but it's, uh, I think Wankanakari is a 42-bed hostel, so 32 it's, beds at Wankanakari. Yeah, and it's, uh, uh, at the moment, uh, it's, uh, and recently that number has changed, Senator, and I'm looking as of recent times, uh, 42, there's actually, uh, as, in, as of this week, four offline, so we have 30, uh, 30, uh, 38 beds available. Apologies. Okay, and uh, and then so with Alice Springs, can we go through how many beds are available in Alice Springs? Uh, Alice Springs. I'm just having difficulty locating these quickly. Um, Apologies for that. So, Senator, uh, we don't have necessarily the numbers by region. So, there are five hostels in Alice Springs, and Mr. Harvey would have to add up those numbers. Uh, so, perhaps if we take that on notice and provide you with the answer. Could you also do the same for Catherine and Darwin as well? Yes, Senator, members? I'll do that. So, Apologies. Senator, you're seeking the number of beds that are available in those uh, locations? Yes, and the number of beds that have been taken offline. Thank you. If any, if any. Yeah. But thank you. Um, so, has the uh, Aboriginal hostel taken new residents? If, if I talk specifically in the Northern Territory, in the uh, past six months? Sorry. Yes, Sen Senator, we have. Okay. In all your hostels across the Territory, Mr Chalmers? Uh, yes, Senator. There will be times when we've had a COVID outbreak in a hostel where we may stop taking uh, residents uh, whilst there is a, we're needing to quarantine, but uh, they're very temporary arrangements and uh, we don't have any blanket policy of not taking new residents. So if a resident has COVID, say, in Daisy Armour here in Darwin, Hostel, what happens? What's your process? Well, Senator, we work with the Public Health Unit in the Northern Territory um, to determine what the best approach is. Uh, initially, uh, where we had COVID cases in our hostels, because our hostels are very much uh, communal uh, facilities, so it's very difficult for someone to be quarantined uh, in them. We have shared bathrooms and shared facilities. Um, we would uh, work with the public health unit and the person would be quarantined. And I think uh, in the Northern Territory that was in Bachelor. Um, those facilities in more recent times came under a lot of pressure. And so in some of our hostels, we were able to quarantine people in the hostel. It really depended on that we had enough staff to make sure that we could deliver meals to rooms and to make sure the person was, uh, was, was looked after. But uh, generally speaking, uh, when someone, when a resident came down with uh, COVID, they were moved by the public health unit to a, a, a territory facility. Okay, you mentioned bachelor there. Um, have you got an isolation unit in bachelor, or are you meaning that Alice Springs facility? No, uh, the facility I'm referring to was a Northern Territory government facility. Okay, so that would be at Howard Springs? 
Well, I'm looking at Mr. Harvey now. Yes, Senator, in the, uh, in the case of Alice Springs, in the case of the Northern Territory, they went to the uh, Darwin um, Quarantine Centre. In the case of uh, Alice Springs, they had a, a, a particularly a hotel that they'd converted to a quarantine centre and were able to send uh, residents to those quarantine centres. We work very close with public health authorities and we're consulting with them. And in some cases um, where quarantine centres uh, cannot cope with the load, we'll make an assessment in consultation uh, with the uh, public health authorities whether that, page, uh, that resident can remain with us. But generally, we've uh, worked very closely and um, the, the uh, public health authorities in the Territory, both in Darwin, Alice, and also in Tennant and Catherine, have been able to transfer COVID positive residents to quarantine centres. So how many patients uh, or of your clients in the hotels in Alice Springs have been quarantine facility? Senator, I've, I think I heard your question. You said how many have been impacted uh, across all of our hostels across Australia We've had 100, and this is as of Monday last week, 108 residents have been have tested positive to COVID. 36 of our staff uh, have tested positive uh, to COVID, and that's across 37 um, uh, across 31 hostels. When I look in Alice Springs, um, five of our hostels have been impacted uh, by um, uh, COVID. And in the case of uh, Alice Spring, the Visitor Park 11, Topsy 11, Sid Ross 7, Aprinia 5, and Eliata 11. So if we look in particular at the impact across Australia, uh, we've been mostly impacted, unfortunately, in the NT in terms of our residents uh, that have had um, COVID and not dissimilar numbers um, have, uh, have occurred in Darwin as well, but not as high as we've been impacted in uh, Alice Springs as well. But I'd say again, would you, uh, sorry, over to you, Senator. I was just going to say, would, would you, is Alice Springs the most um, numbers that you have of residents in yes, with it, COVID out of Yes, it is. Yes, it is, Senator. Um, but it's also a reflection of um, the number of uh, hostels that we have in the NT as well. So we have 17 of our 45 hostels. And you, you would probably be aware that hostels such as the Visitor Park and others are quite large hostels. So uh, that's part of the uh, reason that, um, that it's been uh, impacted. Um, and those impacts are obviously, most of those impacts are this uh, calendar year. So we've been particularly, and our residents have been particularly impacted uh, this calendar year, Senator. Senator McCarthy, you've had the call for close to 15 minutes now. So if you could wrap up as economically as possible with your questions, that would be appreciated. All right, thank you, Chair. Look on the question. Um, Mr. Chuan, AHL facilities in the Northern Territory taking crisis accommodation referrals for victims of domestic violence? Uh, uh, is our, are our hostels de dealing with those issues? Uh, we uh, provide services to a whole range of client groups, uh, Senator, and we have been approached in terms of, if you're talking in the context of COVID outcomes, whether we can take additional residents, we can in the sense of our capacity. If there's lockout or lockdown arrangements, we are obviously uh, dealing with those issues. The other thing we do if we have a COVID outbreak in our hostel, um, we stop any intake. But we will always uh, take on any residents we can, deal with any residents. Um, we have had approaches and we work with the local authorities, the local Aboriginal community organisations to manage those requirements. So yes, we are. Uh, we talk through, um, in particular in the COVID environment, 
um, the issues that were associated with social distancing, shared bathrooms and those sort of things. But generally, we will uh, open our doors and assist our colleagues, uh, our, our territory and state government colleagues, communities to deal with uh, the pressure points in terms of the, uh, uh, the impact that COVID is having on our, on our uh, community, Senator. Senator, to go specifically to your question, though, uh, we don't provide wraparound services um, for our clients. We try and connect them to other services, and particularly for domestic violence uh, uh, referrals. Uh, whilst we would uh, not turn away someone, uh, we're not able to provide the specific or for the specific needs that uh, someone in that situation would have. Okay, th thank you, Mr. Chalmers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator McCarthy, and thank you to Aboriginal Hostels Limited for appearing here today. Um, we will send you off thank with you. our thanks for your testimony, and the committee will now suspend uh, until five past eleven. reconvene and I welcome Mr Craig Ritchie, Chief Executive Officer and other officers of AIATSIS and I'm sure you will tell me how to pronounce that particular acronym rather than just spelling <laughs> it out. Um, Mr Ritchie, do you wish to make an opening statement? Um, uh, I, I need to acknowledge as a Dungati man that I'm, uh, we're on Ngunnawal country today and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And thank it's uh, IATSIS. I access. Yeah. Got it. Thank you for that, Mr. Ritchie. Uh, Senator McCarthy. I, I misled you, Chair, oh. just a, a moment ago, so it's not the Chair's fault. Uh, I, I don't think Senator McCarthy does have questions for IATSIS. If, if there are um, no questions from other Senators, I'm, I, I mean, it might just be an opportunity for Mr. Ritchie to give us a few minutes on what, where, where the organisation's up to at this stage and, um, and, and what the key I think that Issues would be helpful. Are, um, uh, if you ask that as a question, Senator Ayres. Take, take it as a question, Mr Ritchie, welcome. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you uh, to you and all your colleagues. And I thought it would just be an opportunity for the community to hear from you um, at this juncture, if you can. Uh, terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, I guess by way of introduction, um, IATSIS is our national um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural institution. Uh, we're fast approaching our 60th anniversary. We were established in 1964 mm -hmm. uh, by Act of Parliament. And uh, for all of those almost six decades, we've been very active in the research space, um, but also building in a, a national collection that is the largest collection of its kind related to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and heritage. Um, and uh, we continue uh, to do that work. Um, our mission um, uh, is to do uh, in the context of our act is to do um, uh, four things really. It's to tell the story of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australia, which we do of course in close partnership with uh, First Nations groups around the country, to create opportunities for people to engage, all Australians to engage with um, our cultures as First Nations people, um, and uh, to but also to support the cultural uh, revitalisation and resurgence that's happening uh, in our communities around um, this country. Um, and also to speak to our national story. And I guess the most significant development for us um, in that space was the announcement in January of uh, $316.5 million to support the construction of a designated National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural precinct uh, in the parliamentary zone, uh, which we're very, very excited about. It's been a, a source of advocacy, uh, a point of advocacy for the Institute in our strategic plan since 2018. Um, and also, but in the case uh, since that time, that precinct will of course um, house a new home for the Institute uh, that's purpose built and fit for purpose uh, for the Institute in the 21st century. Uh, but it will also um, house a national uh, resting place that will respectfully care for uh, Indigenous ancestral remains that have returned from overseas as part of the Commonwealth repatriation program. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, largely poor, poor provenance, can't go back to their own country. Um, that work is currently carried out 
by the National Museum of Australia um, and once the resting place is finished uh, being built, we'll transfer there. So it's care of those ancestral remains, but importantly, it's ongoing research to identify uh, which specific uh, First Nations those uh, ancestors uh, come from so that they can be returned home um, as uh, 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 respectfully as possible. So that's very, very exciting. Um, and uh, we're very busy, as you might imagine, uh, with all of the logistics associated with that. Mr Ritchie, can I just interrupt you there, because I do have a couple of questions about this. Um, what sort of consultation process have you, um, have you designed or are you implementing to consult with local communities about um, the code of process for the cultural precinct? So we, um, during the course of the initial business case development, uh, and the um, detailed business case development that ultimately led to the government decision to fund the project undertook close consultation, particularly with traditional owner groups here in Canberra. Um, and uh, there were several detailed consultations over the last, particularly intensely over the last year, um, to develop the, the final business case that went to government. Uh, we're in the process at the moment of finalising the design of an ongoing consultation process, particularly in the context of design of the facilities, uh, but also in terms of scope of practice and operating model. Uh, particularly, um, I can say, around the National Resting Place. The National Resting Place um, idea was the subject of an, a major national consultation and, uh, and a report that was produced in 2014, so we've relied on that. Um, in terms of shaping the broad parameters of the project. But obviously given um, uh, both the Institute's long-standing commitment to working with Indigenous uh, people and First Nations around the country, but also the government's policy commitment around co-design, uh, we're, we're, as I say, we're finalising the design of, an, uh, of a consultation process uh, that will be ongoing through the project. Thank you very much, Mr Ritchie. Um, Senator Thorpe's here and I suspect she has some questions for you, so I'll give her the call. Love Black Friday, of course, so I have <laughs> questions. Uh, and it's following on from, I think, what you've just been talking mm -hmm. about in terms of uh, the consultation process uh, around the... Um, this significant place that uh, has been a a topic of conversation amongst traditional owners here. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of consultation, and given the fact that we do an acknowledgement to country every time we sit in this place, have you spoken to Ngambri and Ngunnawal people about what's about to happen on their country? Uh, yes, Senator, we have. Uh, we've spoken to um, the Ngunnawal people via the United Ngunnawal Elders Council. Um, and the Ngambri Land Council and the Ngambri people um, and about in, in the development of the proposals that went to government. Um, extensively, we've got, um, I would say, let me just check my notes here. Um, we um, also, we talked to, so we talked to traditional owners here about the proposal um, and also engaged with um, the tent embassy. Uh, although they're not traditional owners from here, it's a very important stakeholder in the parliamentary zone, uh, to make sure people were aware, had input, had an opportunity to shape, and that will be ongoing. Did you receive consent? Free, prior and informed consent? Or was it just a conversation? They were conversations uh, based on... Um, well, we... It, they were conversations. So no consent? Uh, no, I believe we have consent from uh, the traditional owners, yes. So your department has free, prior and informed consent to continue with the project from the traditional owners here, both Ngambri and Ngunnawal, is that right? Uh, we, have condition, uh, we have consent and approval and engagement from the United Ngunnawal Elders Council. Uh, we uh, have an ongoing conversation around that with the Ngambri and uh, that will happen uh, uh, over the next few months. Are you aware that there are Ngambri and Ngunnawal elders that don't give consent? And if you're not aware of that, um, would you be open to 
um, addressing that. But if you are aware of that, what are you doing about it? I'm not aware that um, that there are um, elders that haven't given consent, no. They, these elders are claiming that you've been speaking to the wrong people. Are you aware of that? No. None so of those, they haven't none of come up as part of the consultation process at all? Uh, not, the, not to my knowledge and, and certainly not directly with me. And the most recent conversations that I've had uh, with both Ngunnawal and Ngambri were uh, the day before the government's and the Prime Minister's announcement on the 5th of January. And in those conversations, uh, there was no suggestion and no, certainly no expression to me that consent was being withheld or not given. Would you um, see that see this questioning as an action item for your department to take up and clarify if there are any traditional owners who do not consent? Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Uh, as part of that project, will there be truth telling and acknowledging of the frontier wars in the work of Nagara? So um, Nora is... is Nora. Yeah, so uh, Ngura is a precinct. The two institutions that will occupy that precinct is, uh, are IATSIS and the National Resting Place. Uh, so to the extent that those issues come up in the work that IATSIS does, either via our research or in the process of, of our collecting, uh, management of our collection, uh, yes, I, I don't think that it's envisaged that Ngura will have any form of monument uh, in relation to the, the frontier wars, but that's part of the national story. And so um, uh, our job, as we see it at IATSIS, is to tell our story as First Nations um, people in its fullness, which includes, obviously, the frontier wars. It includes the experience of Indigenous people uh, in terms of colonisation, but also uh, our experience as uh, people in our own right not just being seen in relation to the experience of colonisation. So we've got a, as, as, I don't need to tell you this, but it's worth stating for the record that uh, the, the approach of IATSIS to the story of Australia is that it doesn't begin in 1788 and mm. it didn't begin in 1770. It stretches back 65,000 mm. years. Um, and that part of our story is uh, as important to be told mm. um, as the experience of colonisation. So the reason the bones of our people are in these museums is because of racism. Mm. How will this be acknowledged as part of this project? So in the construction of uh, the National Resting Place, which will be a new facility and, and, and in uh, Canberra, the work that the Resting Place uh, will do is currently being done uh, via the National Museum. Um, that is the res provenance, research and respectful care of um, our ancestors' remains uh, before they can go home to country. Um, it is proposed, although this will be the subject of the ongoing consultation with uh, Indigenous people, that the National Resting Place will have a storytelling function which will tell the story of uh, the, uh, that sits around repatriation. So the reasons why our ancestors were, are in foreign institutions. Um, and uh, their journey home. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I say, the scope of that and what that looks like is going to be the mm. subject of consultation. Mm. Um, and so it's a bit hard for me to kind of preempt what that might look like. Mm. But I would imagine that, the, uh, that broadly speaking, the National Resting Place will tell that full story. Mm. That's just my last question, Chair. Um, so, you know, in Victoria, we're always fighting the museum to get our people mm. out of there. Yeah. And we have museums around the world that have stolen our bones and our skulls, and we're fighting them to get our remains back. With the National Museum having... Uh, what kind of ownership do they have? Do we have to fight them to have our own self-determining principles of looking after our own people's remains, or, ha or do we have to beg the National Museum to ensure that there is a self-determination element to what's going on here? So it's, it's not for me to speak on behalf of the National Museum, but I do know, and I should say IATSIS doesn't have any responsibility for the Commonwealth Repatriation Program, that's the Office of the Arts. 
but I am aware that the ancestral remains that the National Museum cares for as part of the repatriation program are not accessioned into the museum's collection, so they don't become part of the collection. The work that the museum does is in, uh, in care of those uh, ancestors and ongoing uh, provenance research uh, in an effort to identify the specific location that those ancestors come from. Um, I don't imagine uh, that there will be a fight at all um, around the return of those. I should say that the National Resting Place and the work that the museum done is, do is related to uh, remains that are, or so I should say ancestors that are returned to Australia under the Commonwealth program. There's no intention that state-based institutions, museums, universities and so forth will transfer the ancestral and indigenous remains that they currently care for to the National Resting Place. That's not part of the plan. Um, that would be both culturally inappropriate and a, net, and a, and a pretty uh, blatant effort at cost, sh cost shifting on the part of the states and territories. Mm -hmm. um, but in answer to your question, Senator, I don't foresee any difficulty um, in negotiating the return of these remains from the National Museum at all. I will squeeze one more in. Sure. Uh, our resting place in Victoria mm -hmm. is behind the uh, Shrine of Remembrance. Mm -hmm. It's a little rock right. with a little plaque and it has 38 nations mm -hmm. represented. That every Australia Invasion Day is damaged with broken beer bottles it's smashed over that rock and we have to clean it up every year. What protections will be in place for our ancestors who are being um, put, put to rest in this place? Will they have protections and be honoured and respected in the same way as, say, the Shrine of Remembrance? Uh, so in terms of that last part of your question, absolutely. It's our intention as an institute um, in leading this uh, capital project to, to make sure that in the design of um, the precinct and the facilities that are housed in it, those issues around security and safety and protection uh, are incorporated into the design. Um, and. Um, in, and so that's, so that's the security side of things and uh, to work uh, as closely as you can with specific First Nations in relation to their own ancestors but more broadly with traditional owners here to ensure that cultural safety is maintained and those elders are protected by appropriate cultural practice and ceremony. I should say there is also no intention to bury ancestral remains in the ground here. Mm. Uh, so there will be appropriate um, facilities built that uh, will care for the remains because the key part of the name is resting. It's a rest stop uh, on that an those ancestors' journey home and so we don't intend to bury anybody in the ground. Mm. That's not the, our, our vision here. Um, it is uh, purely a respectful and culturally appropriate house for them to rest in what, until they can go home. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Uh, one yes, of course, here. Senator Dodson. Just on the what seems to be a very exciting uh, development for the uh, IATSIS uh, institution, the, the um, digitisation centre at Dallas Springs. Can you tell us a bit about what is that uh, contemplated uh, to achieve and how is it going to operate? It sounds a very exciting thing. It's, I'm interested in it. We're very excited about that, Senator. It's part of the IATSIS Council's um, vision to ensure that um, as a national institution, we're not national just because our, we've got a headquarters in the national capital, but we do in fact extend our reach across the country. Um, uh, as you'd be aware, um, uh, Central, Alice Springs is a hub for the Central Australian region, and so the decision to locate a digitisation and access hub there is really a critical and exciting one. Work's currently underway at the moment. Um, to refurbish the facilities that we've taken a lease out on. Um, it will do a number of things. We will partner with First Nations Media Australia to make sure that um, uh, digitisation is actually happening so that uh, particularly those um, uh, recordings and, and, and such that are on uh, volatile material, particularly ferromagnetic tape, are digitised and preserved 
so that communities in that region can have access to their material. Uh, there will be storage facilities there, so we envisage that some of our collection that's currently looked after here in Canberra from that region will be able to go home. And we hope to be able to provide some support to the Strello Research Centre around their storage needs. Uh, in addition to that, it will include some public engagement space, space for exhibitions, space for community um, and public education in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, issues and uh, cultures, particularly uh, focusing on the Central Australia region. Um, and we also hope, uh, or envisage rather, we don't hope, we envisage that there will be uh, some capacity to include training of community members in cultural, man uh, cultural heritage management. Uh, so that um, that capacity is being built in communities to look after their own um, material in, in a way that's right for them. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Dodson, and thank you to IATSIS, I don't know how to pronounce it before, um, for appearing today. Um, we'll send you off with our thanks for your thank testimony you. and bring on Oric. Lost a lot of people out of the room now. Um, I welcome Mr. Garrett Wanganeen, Acting Registrar of the Office of the Register of Indigenous Corporations. Mr. Wanganeen, did you wish to make an opening statement? Oh, note that you tabled, sorry, your opening statement. Yeah, thank you, uh, Senator. And if I may, I'd just like to um, uh, speak to that. So, uh, as a Narunga man, uh, I too would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Nambri people, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the room and online with us today. Um, I'd also like to recognise the contribution of the former registrar, Selwyn Button, who left the position on the 3rd of December, um, and I've been acting in the role since then. Uh, obviously, during his tenure, uh, Mr Button worked to strengthen uh, the relationships with the stakeholders um, and raise issues of transparency and accountability, particularly around native title benefits, and set a new strategic vision for ORIC. Um, he also started to position strongly to work in um, emerging and future environments, and one of those obviously is uh, the indigeneity uh, issues that are around at the moment. Um, and I know that's something that was touched on in the last uh, Senate estimates, and to that end, OREC has issued a revised uh, policy statement um, on how we'll handle indigeneity within our corporations, um, and we've done that last month, and that's available uh, on our website. Um, so that will uh, uh, our expectation is the policy will help to further strengthen the stakeholder and public uh, confidence in the corporations that they're dealing with um, that are registered under the CATSI Act. Uh, in terms of our regulated population, um, it continues to grow and I understand that we've provided a, a snapshot uh, to the committee. So uh, as of Wednesday, there were 3,463 uh, 3, corporations, including 240 uh, registered native title uh, bodies corporate. Um, so obviously we're also buoyed by um, growing interest in better um, practice around as well. So last November we held, hosted our inaugural Governance Day. Uh, we did that online and that was a free forum uh, designed to evaluate and inspire board capability or focused on that. Uh, and speakers from a range of different groups uh, took part. It was six hours and we were pleased that 125 people attended. The majority um, stayed online for those six hours. Um, we do have a, a slightly slower rate in annual reports this year, um, but we are uh, pursuing that, uh, so we are uh, continuing on with those. Um, obviously, the CATSI Act uh, does uh, emphasise that uh, importance of compliance and their accountability, making sure that the members have got the opportunity to see uh, the information about their corporation, but also ours. 
Um, obviously, given the pandemic, we are aware that there are some issues around um, some aspects of those reporting, and, and people do like to, or well, corporations do like to, uh, let their members know before they lodge them with ORIC. Um, so we will expect that those general reports will continue to come in, and those financial reports will continue to come in. Um, and then the uh, the final thing um, I'd like to make the point of, uh, Senator, is the successful prosecution that occurred on Monday. Um, so ORIC. Uh, uh, successfully prosecuted with the help of the uh, Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions, a former CEO of an art centre on Mornington Island, um, and that individual was uh, charged with 35 uh, counts of using his position dishonestly um, and taking out uh, uh, a number of, uh, uh, taking advantage of a number of vulnerable people uh, in the arts uh, industry. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, he was given a custodial sentence and also. Uh, importantly, uh, reparations to both the corporation and the artists involved there. So, thank you very much, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator Thorpe. You have the call. Thank you, Chair. Um, my first question is around the uh, registrar being recruited. So, obviously, you're still acting, but what is the plan to install a new permanent registrar? I might refer that one to uh, NIAA. Uh, Good morning, Senators. Blair Exel, Deputy Chief Executive Officer for Operations Livery. There is a process that's been underway um, since late last year. Uh, we're working through the approval process for, for that right now, Senator. Is there a time frame? I can't set an exact time frame, but um, it's towards the end of the process, if I can say that simply. Thank you. In my question on Notice 175 from last year's supplementary estimates, I asked about how ORIC assists, in this case, the One Year PBC, to correct and re-lodge previous year's financial statements, given that they were all incorrect. You answered that although directors of corporations are responsible for the preparation of financial reports in accordance with the CATSI regulations, it is not expected that they would lodge previous year's financial reports. Does this basically mean that corporations can get away with lodging incorrect reports? Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. I think in terms of, um, particularly with the one-year ones, um, quite often uh, the audited financial statements and the auditor's reports um, will note where there's been corrections to previous years uh, audit uh, uh, or to financials. So quite often uh, subsequent years will, uh, within the notes of a general purpose uh, financial report, um, make notes of corrections to previous years. So um, we would expect that um, if there was, um, if, if the corporation chose to update uh, previous year's financial reports, that they would be available. Um, otherwise, we would expect that uh, there would be corrections noted in uh, the audited financial reports of, of uh, corporations going forward. So no consequence. People can just put in incorrect financial reports over and over again. Is there any consequence for doing that? Uh, if we're well aware that the, if we, if we're made aware that the corporations are, um, uh, the, the financial reports are, are wrong and willingly wrong, um, there are consequences within the CATSI Act. So we can uh, prosecute for failure to report or providing um, false documents to uh, the registrar. Obviously, there are uh, things that need to be met with that, and it would be a, a criminal prosecution, so we would have to undertake uh, work to uh, satisfy a, a criminal court um, that um, individuals, uh, I guess, for uh, reports that are consistently wrong, that, that people were doing that willingly, knowingly, and probably um, deliberately to be able to, to do that. Um, Conscious in mind, obviously, that um, again the uh, the registrar uh, is um, 
not, uh, not necessarily uh, going to go to criminal prosecutions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander corporations or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people um, uh, as, our, as our first step. Um, but certainly, uh, if we were made aware that there was um, a deliberate attempt to provide uh, wrong information in their reporting, then we could, uh, we could go forward with that. Thank you. Has one year PBC lodged a financial report for 2021? Sorry, the laptop's just gone off. Uh, it hasn't as yet. No. Senator. No. no. Okay. Community has raised concerns with me that the Balanu Waluwara Wankayuru or BWW, Registered Native Title Body Corporate, has not been meeting since 2017-18. Can you confirm if the corporation has held any AGM since 2017 and provide <coughs> the dates and locations of where they were held? Uh, so, Senator, corporations aren't ordinarily required to um, report to the registrar the dates or that they've held their AGMs. We normally find those through complaints. I am aware that previously um, we have had um, complaints about uh, BWW not holding um, uh, uh, annual report, uh, uh, sorry, annual general meetings. Um, but I would have to, um, uh, I would have to check as to how recent any of those uh, complaints would be. So I don't have any information on that, but I'm happy to take that on so notice. So do you receive annual returns from them? We do um, receive annual returns from, uh, from them, and again, I don't have the information with me on um, uh, BWW specifically, but I'm happy to take that on notice um, and provide the Senator to, an answer to that. Um, as I said, the, the, um, they do are required to provide annual reports. A lot of corporations do show good governance and take their annual reports and annual fi financial station, uh, statements um, to their annual general meetings, but it's not currently a requirement of the uh, CATSI Act for them to table those uh, audited financials at an AGM. It's just a requirement of the CATSI Act for them to make those audited financial statements available to members. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions in regards to properties purchased by the South West Aboriginal Land and Sea Council in our Cabello, Midland and South Guildford in WA. Has ORIC investigated the purchase of these properties? Uh, no, Senator ORIC hasn't investigated these, the, uh, the purchase of those properties. I understand that um, there has been uh, some assistance provided uh, from uh, NIA, NIAA to the corporation, but ORIC hasn't uh, investigated the purchase of those properties, no. So I understand the ORIC regulations are being updated. Will this follow a process of co-design that is firmly grounded in self-determination? The, the ORIC um, regulations, uh, that would be a question again for NIAA, who um, are the policy holders for this, um, but certainly we would uh, assist uh, with that. I'm happy to take that to I double NIAA, but if you want to answer. Yeah. Um, Chair Ben Burden, sorry, um, Ben Burden, Group Manager, Program Performance Delivery at the NIAA. Um, the process for the updating the regulations um, for the CATSI Act um, is, is in train, as Senator, as you're aware, where there's a process of updating um, the main act itself. There's a series of consequential uh, regulatory or amendments to the regulations that follow. I just want to know if the principles of self-determination um, are in there. So we, we've consulted uh, on, those, uh, on those regulations. Um, uh, I can um, provide you with the details. I think they were open for a, a short period of consultation um, before Does it include Christmas. the principles of self-determination? In, I'm, I'm not quite clear on the question. How, Do you the, understand what self-determination is from a black person's perspective? I wouldn't uh, propose to. Um, I'm just I'm trying to understand how uh, 
trying to respond to your question in terms of the consultation process for the regulations um, being taken forward as, uh, as, as part of the parliamentary process. I guess Mr Burton is trying to say this is what we've done and if he sets that out, um, then the assessment from um, the shoes you're in of whether or not um, <coughs> that meets yes. your definition is, is a more subjective matter. Um, it's probably more appropriate that he says what's been done um, and others can make the assessment of whether or not um, it... Yeah, I, I don't want to hear what's been done. I want to know whether there's self-determination principles in um, the updated version because if we talk about co-design, then if you've got blackfellas at the table, they'll make sure self-determination's there and I just want to know if it's there or not. Well, Senator Thorpe, um, the process that's been put in place endeavours to do that. Okay. Um, it's certainly the intention at every stage um, to honour and respect the importance of that. Uh, we just wouldn't want to um, speak for somebody else in making that assessment. Um, okay. But it's certainly something that is tried to be delivered upon at every stage. Yeah. Excellent. Love when the government tries to instill self-determination principles in their work. I'll go to the next question. Are you aware of any claims of breaches of duty at the South West Aboriginal Land and Sea Council? Uh, I'm aware that there have been complaints made around uh, the South West uh, Land and Sea Council uh, and um, previous um, uh, executive of that. Um, Based on our assessment of those claims to this stage, Senator, I'd have to say um, we haven't been provided with any evidence that would um, substantially support that. Um, but it is obviously something that if ORIC was provided with um, further documentary evidence, we'd be happy to, to look into. Thank you. My final question is, can you take me through in detail what ORIC has done to be fully satisfied that the South West Aboriginal Land and Sea Council is operating without corruption or mismanagement because there are issues and not enough seems to be done. Okay. Uh, Senator, I don't have my, um, I don't have any notes specifically on the South West sea, uh, Land and Sea Council um, with me, but I'm happy to take your question on notice and give you uh, information around our actions in regard to that corporation. Thank you very much. No further questions. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Senator Thorpes. Senator Ayres, I understand you have a couple of questions. I do. Thank you. Um, I noticed the chair framed me up for just a couple, uh, which is fair enough. Um, Mr Wanganeen, welcome. I, I just wanted to get a sense of how many uh, First Nations businesses are registered with ORIC? Uh, so uh, we have 3,000 as of, sorry, as of Wednesday, 3,463 corporations registered with us, Senator. And um, registration with ORIC is um, uh, entirely um, a matter for the organisation itself, isn't it? It could be registered yes. with ORIC or it could be registered um, with um, you know, co co sort of corporate regulators. For the most part, that's true, Senator. There are um, some cases um, that we are aware of. So obviously, a registered native title body corporate um, that has native title responsibilities under the Native Title Act um, and has been determined by the federal court must be registered uh, under the CATSI Act. Um, and I'm also aware that um, a, a registered Aboriginal party in Victoria. Uh, is required to be uh, registered under the CATSI Act, oh, see, yeah. um, but otherwise... Um, so there's a small number that are compulsory register and then there's a sort of voluntary. And do, do you have any um, visibility from, um, from ORIC um, over uh, or organisations that win contracts with the Commonwealth? No, Senator, we're so not. So you don't, you don't re apart from what they would... Um, you know, the information that they're compulsorily required to provide um, 
in in the normal sort of re regulatory oversight, you, you don't get much visibility about um, you know the business conditions and their trading. Or, you know, the, it's it's the it's the normal corporate regulatory oversight. Yeah, normal corporate corporate uh, re regulatory oversight. We do obviously the our um, general reports that are required from all of our corporations. Yeah. Um, do ask corporations for uh, both total income and also grant income. Uh, but that grant income isn't separated into any level of government, so that grant could be uh, it, that's uh, reported there could be Commonwealth, it could be state or territory, or it could even be uh, local council, or um, potentially even uh, philanthropic grants. I think uh, would yeah. be covered in those as well. So, Th thank you, um, Ms. Brown. The um, does NIAA have um, visibility through? Um, through either Supply Nation or any of these initiatives over um, Commonwealth contracts that uh, that have been, you know, that have been won by uh, Indigenous organisations. Yeah, they were just the officer that um, looks after the Indigenous procurement policy is probably the best person to that. So we just there next door. If you, have to, if you want to bring Thank that you. to the next session, no, to yeah, I was going to suggest, Chair, I, I, the, I, I, the, the next bracket of questions. I just wanted to check with Mr. Wanganee while he was here. Um, I'm, I can ask the next okay. bracket of questions in um, when we come to the agency. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Ta. Great. Thanks, Mr. Very Wanganee. good. Uh, thank you very much. Senator Ayres, and thank you to Oric for appearing here today, and we'll now bring in the NIAA. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, I will flag with senators that um, we're running about 10 minutes behind schedule, but I would like us to endeavour to deal with NIAA before the lunch break, which is due at 12.30. So if senators could keep that in consideration when asking their questions, that would be appreciated. Um, I welcome again Ms Jodie Bruin, Chief Executive Officer and other officers of the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Ms Bruin, do you wish to make any other additional comments at this time? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair and Senators. Uh, Wandiwa. Um, I firstly wish, wish, to, wish to acknowledge we are on Ngunnawal and Ngambri uh, country and pay my respects to the elders and ancestors of this country. I would also like to acknowledge the re record level of representation we see uh, in the parliament and across senior levels of the public service. And I ex extend my respect to all of you and other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander witnesses appearing here today. Um, thank you for the opportunity to make a brief statement. I, I might um, shorten it and table the rest of it, thank if that's you. okay with you, Appreciate in the interest of your time. Um, as the committee knows, I have commenced as uh, Chief Executive Officer of the National Indigenous Australians Agency this week uh, on Monday and uh, look forward to leading a passionate, committed and highly productive agency. I think when you look at the record of the agency over the last, over the last couple of years, um, an incredible amount of work has been delivered and progress has been made. Uh, to improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. In this forum, I would like to publicly acknowledge the invaluable work of my predecessor, uh, Mr Ray Griggs, in establishing the agency and cementing its place in the public service landscape. I would also like to acknowledge the uh, excellent stewardship of Mr Blair Exel, who has been acting in, in the chief executive role um, for the last seven months, and Mrs. Uh, Ms Letitia Hope as uh, deputy CEO who have been instrumental in steering the agency through an important period. 
For those who have not yet had the pleasure to, uh, that I have not had the pleasure to meet, I am Angie Bundy, a woman from the Pilbara, and I'm deeply committed to community decision making and empowerment uh, through so strong community governance and uh, employment. Um, and working with communities, Indigenous organisations and government to build trust and capacity to work in uh, genuine partnership uh, will be a focus of mine going forward. I also bring a deep commitment to accountability and transparency and with that lens I look forward to supporting the committee in this work. In the interest of the committee's time, I'll leave it there through the statement but I'll table the rest of the statement uh, and um, if you'll forgive me, I, I will be uh, deferring a lot of the questions to my uh, deputies and the appropriate um, senior staff of the agency to answer detailed questions. Um, given this is my fifth day in the job, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms Bruin. Um, and I must apologise also, I got a little overexcited with the uh, schedule for today as we are trying to keep everything to time and I didn't realise that the NIAA is due to continue yes. after lunch until That's 2 right. o'clock. So I don't want to say no rush to my colleagues because I know they'll take That's me right. at my word, but we do have a little bit of time after lunch so we won't be dismissing you once we get to the break. Uh, Senator Ayres, you have the call. Before we go to Senator Ayres, oh. can I just take this opportunity to... Um, welcome the new Czech Chief Executive Officer to the agency and to Estimates, um, and, and thank you for taking on such an important role. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Sorry, Senator Ayres. Look, I, uh, obviously, uh, from Labor's perspective, I also would like to uh, welcome you to the role, um, and also just to place on record uh, my appreciation for the um, evidence and cooperation uh, that this committee got from Mr Griggs in various Estimates hearings and um, and to all of the staff of the agency. I think, um, I think that uh, Mr Wanganine uh, a, a few moments ago said that, um, that uh, there were 3,463 um, organisations registered with ORIC. That, that probably, that there are probably more, you know, there, there might be some more uh, organisations that might be characterised as, you know, business companies and business organisations that might be characterised as, um, you know, indigenous companies. Does does the agency have any sense of how? Is there a number that you would apply to the number of uh, indigenous businesses operating in the Australian private sector? Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, Letitia Hope, Deputy CEO, Programs and Policy. Uh, can I too acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands, including those senators who are online, as a Bundjalung Torres Strait Islander woman and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging for their continuing custodianship of country knowledge and culture and extend that respect to everybody uh, providing testimony and also in lines of inquiry today. Uh, Ms Deb Fulton. We'll take your question. Thanks, Senator. Thanks, Ms Fulton. Morning. Uh, Deborah Fulton, Acting Group Manager, Economic Policy and Programs. We would probably mostly rely on the Supply Nation website to yes. have a sense of the, the Indigenous businesses there. Uh, so I don't actually have a number with me, but I can look it up while we're speaking. Yeah, OK, thank you. And, and does the agency have any oversight of the number of contracts that, um, you know, I, for, I, I know, for example, that uh, in the last um, in 2020 to 21, on Austender, the Commonwealth let j just slightly over 84,000 contracts um, uh, to businesses. Some of them would have been Australian businesses. Some of them would have been, um, you know, overseas companies. Some of them would have been non-government organisations. They'd fall into all sorts of categories. But do, do you have any oversight? Do, does the Commonwealth report to you when it? lets a contract to uh, an Indigenous business? So, Senator, the Commonwealth doesn't report to us, but what I can say, and I think you're referring to, is um, the IPP policy, which of course is the Commonwealth's um, approach at being a savvy purchaser with its yep. money to help increase economic status of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and of course build businesses. Since 2015, we've had around um, over 36,000 contracts 
to the tune of about or above uh, $5.5 billion awarded to over uh, 2,600 Indigenous businesses. So in terms of your question around reporting, what I do know is that uh, in 2020 and 2021 financial year, all portfolios met their targets by number and by, finance, or, and by dollar amount. I don't have the details of that with me, Senator, but I'd be happy to take that on notice for you and provide to the committee. So you'd be able to provide in the 15, 16, 16, 17 and so on financial years the number certainly of... certainly take that on notice I for you, Senator. Now, Sorry, Ms Fulton. Yes, Maybe thank you. That'd you be Senator. terrific. Thanks. So the number of... And in fact, it's a, it's a really good story because it's really increased year on year. So in 2015-16, there were 1,601 uh, contracts, which increased to 3,400 in 16-17. 3,000. Uh, 400. Yeah. In 17-18, it was 4,633. In 18-19, 6,589. Yes. In 19-20, 7,963. And then in last financial year, it exceeded 10,000 for the first time with 10,953. And we have a... Uh, it, it's probably best to wait till the end of financial year for reporting because there's often a lag on contracts for, um, for where we're up to in the current financial year. I might come back to this issue. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I've, my train of thought's been slightly derailed. I think Senator McCarthy is next. Senator McCarthy? I'll give Thank you the call. You. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go to the Aboriginal flag. Uh, so if it's appropriate, um, I'll just are at the table. Um, to inform the committee, what was the total package cost to government to secure the copyright of this, the uh, Aboriginal flag? Thank you, um, Senator, for the question. Can, can I, just before I answer that question, I did want to make one point. Can I um, just thank the committee and acknowledge their patience and forbearance at time over the last couple of years, there have been a number of occasions where the committee sought details um, and have has been, um, uh, well, can I say thanks for the fact that they've held off some of those questions and haven't explored into. They were kind of complex um, and sensitive discussions and negotiations um, and that helped us greatly through that process by the forbearance from the committee. So I did want to say right up front, thank you very much for your support through that process. Um, Senator, to answer your direct question, the, um, uh, I guess the agreed um, financial settlement for the purchase of the copyright across um, three parties was $20.05 million. So what was the total package to secure uh, the copyright of the flag of Mr Thomas? Uh, Senator, so, so that, as I said, that, that was the, I guess, the total package for Mr Thomas and the other parties that were involved in that settlement, two, two other parties, na namely um, WAM and Worcester Holdings. Um, there were some other components, um, which, for example, were uh, costs for the agency around legal costs for, for our, our, our internal aspects. Um, but I'm not sure if you're after those details as, as well. Yes, but I'm asking you to break it down now, Mr. Excel. Sure. So to break down the 20.05 million, Senator? Yes, please. So, um, Senator, I can do that. Um, as I've mentioned, there were three main components, payment to Mr. Harold Thomas and payments to WAM Clothing and to Worcester Holdings. Um, the payment to Mr. Harold Thomas was $13.75 million um, to assign the copyright in full to the Commonwealth um, of the Government of Australia um, and the payments to uh, WAM clothing or the payment to WAM clothing was 5.2 million and the payment to Worcester Holdings was 1.1 million. In the Government's uh, press release on uh, the 25th, the press release said to do this 
We also had to discharge the three existing license arrangements, which included estimating the potential revenue over the life of the contracts and reaching agreement with the licensees on appropriate compensation for them, giving up their exclusive rights. Um, You've said that the three areas, the three parties who were paid was WAM, Worcester Holding and Mr Thomas. Was there also extra paid in terms of um, the government's own legal costs? Uh, yes, Senator. As, as I mentioned, there, there was a cost um, uh, for legal advice that um, assisted NIAA in the process. From memory, and Mr Jacob can confirm, it was approximately about half a million dollars um, uh, for, the, for the total cost in terms of our legal, legal advice. That included not just that, that advice, but also included um, aspects that support the, the negotiations um, around valuations, for example, a, as well. That's correct. Uh, so I just want to, want to be clear, Mr Excel, that half a million dollars was in addition to the $20.05 million. That is correct, Senator. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the press release also talked about the Aboriginal flag the Aboriginal flag is now freely available to be used, reproduced, communicated and shared by all Australians. I note that Carol and Richardson flag World released a press release on the 27th of January, Mr Excel, refuting the government's announcement. Are you aware of that press release? Uh, I am, Senator. So what do you say about flag World's release? <coughs> And is it fair to say that the government's position on reproducing the flag was misleading? Senator, the uh, release that the, the media release that was put up by the government was quite clear in what it covered, and it included specifically the uh, uh, licence arrangements for Flag World. I, I, I would note in, in the release that was put out by um, Caroline Richardson that they noted that the media in part did not represent the full media release, um, and that is something that I think probably did contribute to um, some lack of understanding of the components, but I think the government release was quite clear in terms of articulating the various components of the flag and what could be used and gave examples. Mr so how is the cost of the settlement being paid for? Is it being paid out of the IAS? Uh, Senator, no. There was additional um, funds pr provided to NIAA to settle um, the, the, the licences. Uh, for completeness, the one component that will come out of future allocations for the IES was um, the $100,000 um, per annum scholarship um, that has yet to be finally arranged, but that, that is something that will come out of the scholarship or come out of the IES into the future. But I can assure you that did not impact on any existing programs going forward. Okay. Mr Excel, you said additional funds were provided to NIAA. How much of those additional funds were provided uh, the, to the, you? The, the exact sum of the um, 20.05 million. Yes. So it was, it was actually 20.5 million. 20 point, where 20, were you provided it from? Sorry, Sima. Where were you provided it from? Uh, through government transfer systems, through Department of Finance, um, un unless I'm incorrect. Um, yeah. So now I'll, I'm happy to take on notice the specific kind of timings because obviously there's sequence and payments and things things like that. So, sure. yeah. If you can, um, yep. it's not a trick question, Mr. Excel. Thank you. Just want to understand yeah. where you've received the money. Sure. Um, also, just with the report, obviously we had a Senate inquiry uh, into the Aboriginal flag and made numerous recommendations. And I'd like to read one particular recommendation. Uh, that we came to as part of the Senate inquiry, and that is that the committee considers that the creation of an independent Aboriginal body with custodianship of the Aboriginal flag could be informed by a parliamentary inquiry to ensure its independence and transparency regarding its membership. An independent body with custodianship of the Aboriginal flag could also assist if the Torres Strait Island Regional Council requests it the TSI PSERC with applications for the use of the Torres Strait Islander flag, given the resourcing and administrative burdens associated with processing these applications. We obviously looked at how the Torres Strait Island flag was cared for and its custodianship 
And I'm just wondering whether the recommendations in relation to the Aboriginal flag about custodianship and the care of the flag, other than uh, the Australian government, has been considered. Uh, yes, Senator, I, I, can, I can advise you it was considered. Um, but as was consistent with the government's response um, uh, tabled, um, that the uh, direction um, of the arrangements for the management of the flag will largely come down to the preferences of the creator, Mr Harold Thomas. Um, and I can assure you that that was the very strong um, desire and intent and preference for Mr Thomas that it was to be managed going forward in the way that it has been set up now. So it's as a result of the contractual arrangement with Mr Thomas that it goes directly to the Australian government, not... So I'm not uh, quite sure what you mean by contractual arrangements. I, I'm referring to, as part of the conversations that were ongoing well, throughout the process, Mr Thomas was very clear that um, uh, he saw this and, and he was comfortable with me using his words. Um, he expressed them to our minister um, not, not um, a few weeks ago, that he saw this as a partnership um, between the creator of, of the flag and the Commonwealth Government. Indeed, he saw this as a partnership between the older civilisation and the Commonwealth Government. And did Nye give any advice about an Aboriginal body or authority that could uh, be the uh, custodian of the Aboriginal flag Sorry, to advice, the Prime Minister? Advice to who, Senator? To the Prime Minister. Uh, I can advise you that the government did consider this issue um, and as I've articulated, um, uh, the, the intent of the creator of the flag was the primary consideration in this issue. So Mr Excel, just to be clear, uh, NIAA did, did you give any advice other than Mr Thomas's requests in relation to the Senate committee recommendation? Senator, the advice incorporated and noted the recommendations of the parliamentary committee. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Excel. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator McCarthy. I might give the call to Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just while we're on the flag, uh, obviously, I, you said that it was noted. All, all the work that we did in getting mob here to, to talk about the importance of the flag and what they wanted to do with that. So thank you for the government for noting that, but not implementing that, um, which goes against self-determination. Well, respectfully, Senator Thorpe, um, the, the work of the committee um, has well and truly been taken into account in the negotiation process. But ultimately, when we're dealing with um, the property of an Indigenous man, it's also really important to respect his wishes and his desires as, as the owner and designer and artist responsible for the flag. That's not what I'm so, saying, well, uh, Minister, I'm, with I'm all responding. due respect. Well, I'm responding. This is not about me disrespecting um, another well, Indigenous man. Senator Thorpe, Minister. please don't speak over me once you've finished hearing my well, answer. Well, you're wrong in what you're saying. Well, correct me after I finish, well, Senator don't, Thorpe. Don't By all means, put correct words me into after my I mouth Senator Thorpe. telling me that I'm disrespecting Senator an Indigenous Thorpe. man. Order. Oh, don't come on, Senator Thorpe. You're better than this. Way. Senators, you are better than this. Order. On this committee, uh, we had a couple of conversations earlier in the week, and I recognise that neither of you were here for that, um, about not speaking over one another. Um, if we could try and keep the call and response uh, manner of uh, things intact, that makes it a lot easier for me to hear what's going on. Um, Senator Thorpe, you asked a question. I believe the minister was responding to it. I was trying to. Thank Senator, you. Um, Senator Chandler. The process that was undertaken in negotiating to deliver the outcomes that were desired um, and articulated well by that committee um, were implemented through the negotiation process and done in a way that was designed to respect the proprietary rights of um, the Indigenous man who designed the flag, Mr Thomas. Um, and in doing so, and in accordance with his wishes, um, there is um, to his credit, a lot of give back to the community associated with it. Um, so I wouldn't accept the characterisation of the NIAA's really valuable work in this space as anything other than sincerely reflecting the 
work of the committee um, in trying to resolve what had, until that point, um, the, the point of concluding a negotiation, been Thank quite you. vexed. Thank you. We're running out of time, I think. Um, is that, are you done? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Thank you. Uh, so, in terms of the Aboriginal flag now being colonised by the Australian government, um, is it worth a conversation around sovereignty from, from the NIAA perspective, given we are sovereign, the Aussie flag says that they so they're sovereign. So now that the, the Aboriginal flag has been colonised, is that a, um, a question of sovereignty now that we now need to have a conversation about? Because now you've got two national flags, right? <laughs> so that's actually acknowledging the sovereignty of our people. Is it not? Senator, I would probably um, respond, I think, to that question um, in the way that I articulated previously, which was that, um, uh, in the words of Mr Thomas, he saw this as a partnership between Aboriginal Australia, that's his words, and the Commonwealth Government of Australia. That's not my question, with all oh, due oh, respect. Okay. It's, about, it's, a, it's a question about sovereignty. We have the colonising Australian government who have now recognised and now own our flag, the Aboriginal flag, which to us is a, uh, a sign of resistance and sign of sovereignty. Is it now a conversation about having two national flags um, and actually who are the sovereign people of these lands? Senator, I would probably also note that the Aboriginal flag has been a national flag since 1995. Yes, I so understand that. It's not my question, though. Is it a question of sovereignty now that we have officially uh, the Australian government assimilating and owning our flag um, along with the Australian colonisers' flag? Does that mean that we can now go down a path of a... Um, debate around sovereignty, given we've got the two flags. Senator. Mr Excel, perhaps I could jump in there. Um, we simply cannot, Senator Thorpe, accept the premise of your question. The flag has not been colonised. Um, it has been made available for all Australians and all Indigenous Australians um, so that they can fly it and use it for the purposes for which um, they would like. and. Um, that was something that wasn't possible under the previous arrangements. This is about making the Aboriginal flag have the status and respect and buy-in that it deserves for the future. Um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags are equal in precedence. Their status has not changed in the community. It is simply the case that it is more accessible than ever before for those who do want to use it. Thank you, Senator. Uh, but from the people I am bringing voice to in this place are very concerned that our flag has been colonised, given this is the colonisers' headquarters and they've just purchased our flag, so that means our flag's being colonised. Well, so Senator, I understand you Senator don't get Thorpe, that. Senator Thorpe, is there a question here? I, don't, I understand well, that you don't get that because well, you can't. Senator, Senator I'll go Thorpe, to my next no, question. I really need to respond to that, Yes, Senator. Minister, you may. Um, it is... I hear what you're saying, but I want to reassure those people um, who you are um, uh, attempting to, to share the views of here um, that we have taken the flag from a situation where it was effectively being privately owned to um, a situation where, in accordance with the wishes of the Indigenous designer of the flag, it has been put in a position where it is safe, where it is available to all Indigenous Australians and indeed um, all Australians full stop because we want this to be a flag that gets um, the respect and buy-in and enthusiasm it deserves. Um, this is only about um, making things better. It is not about taking things away. And quite frankly, um, the, the designer of the flag made it very clear that's what he wanted for all Australians so that the flag could be the symbol of unity he wanted it to be. Excellent. Senator, okay, I'm going to go on to my next question because I don't want to run out of time with all due respect. Can I add something to that, if that's okay? So I would also note, and, and um, it hasn't come up yet, so hopefully it's, it's, it's useful for you, Mr Thomas retains the moral rights of the flag. So in terms of some of that framing, he's still the creator, 
what we're talking about here is the purchase of the copyright for how it can be used. So that ownership is still there in, in a sense or that it's moral a really right. Good point, sure. right. Thank you. Um, I'm getting away from the the flag, which is now Australian. Uh, and my next question is I'm just well like all indigenous people. Australian. Sorry? Or just like all indigenous people. They are Australian. It's wonderful. Really? Yes. I, I think it's an uncontroversial proposition that Indigenous Australians are Australians and that inviting oh, all Australians, order. that point inviting order, all order. Australians point to be a part of order, order, no, order, Minister. No, order, Minister. I'm being white explained here. I don't think that's a point of order. I'm Senator being white explained. That is not a point I'm of order. I'm not going to be told by a white Senator that I'm an uh, Indigenous Australian. That is. Insulting. The Senator thought is that is not a point of Absolutely. order. Absolutely. It might be best if you move on to your next question. <sighs> okay. I'm a Gunai, Japarung, Brabralung, Gunichamara woman. I'm, and I'm well aware that running elections is not what we need to be talking about here. But I do, however, need to be <coughs> questioning. Uh, how our people who are in lockdown are going to be able to vote in the next election. So I'd like to know if the NIAA are working with the AEC to facilitate our people to vote. Senator, I, I can possibly answer in the broad, but I think we might have to take, unless my colleagues have more specific information, we have pretty regular conversations with AEC ahead of elections. Um, I'm not aware of any specific conversations around the upcoming election, but my colleagues may do so. Thanks, Senator. I actually don't have much more to add to my colleague except for the fact that um, I do understand that the AEC has got an extensive reach and they are actually reaching out to communities uh, extensively. I also understand that um, there is some recent data, and I'd be happy to take the facts on uh, notice for you, Senator, that in terms of enrolments uh, for the AEC, the Indigenous enrolments are actually at a faster rate than non-Indigenous enrolments at the moment. So in relation to COVID, I, I can't answer that question for you. We'd be happy to take that on yes, notice for you and get you some information. Yeah, and that's great to hear that they're, um, it's on the rise. But because of the biosecurity orders in place in a number of our communities, um, communities are saying to us that the AEC may not be able to get to these communities, so people will not be able to vote. So I would like um, you to take that on notice about what is happening. Um, you know, are there any concerns that we're going to have hundreds of our people not being able to vote because the AEC can't get out there? So, Senator, it, of course it is a matter for the AEC, but we'd be happy to, to, to work with them to take them on notice. And the only other thing I would add, Senator, is as you, as you know, we have a, an extensive presence across the regions. We have uh, 70 officers and pre-COVID uh, visited face-to-face -face over 400 communities, but still have contact with those communities through multiple different mediums. Um, and this is one of the things that the NIAA does facilitate in terms of these kinds of social process messages. So voting, uh, vaccinations, etc. Yeah. And that is one of the social processes that the NIAA yeah. assists. Excellent. So, so just on that, would the NIAA make representation then to the relevant ministers to make sure that our people can vote, even if biosecurity measures are in place? Well, certainly, it's a, it's a matter for the AC, Senator, but I'll certainly, we will certainly take that on notice and see what we can do to assist your inquiry. Great. Um, Thank you. Senator, just to add to that, uh, Robert Ryan, Recognition and Empowerment Branch Manager. We have been meeting with the AC. Um, it is their role, but we have um, offered to provide any support we can to Great. try and ensure that Indigenous enrolment and, and voting is as high as it can possibly be. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Thorpe. Senator Dodson. This is the second time, Chair, that I've led you astray immediately Goodness before me. you've allocated Senator the call. So it, I'm, <laughs> I've been I've, a long I've week. A couple of questions. It has been okay, a long week. Okay, I'll give the call to you, Senator um, Ayres. The reason that I, so I asked a series of questions about uh, contracts for Indigenous businesses, um, and thank you for your answers, and that they are um, they, they are right. Um, if you look at the um, 
of what's been provided uh, on the Supply Nation website, um, 943 Indigenous businesses secured, um, as you said, I think Ms Hope, uh, 10,920 new contracts um, during the 2021 financial year at a value for, for uh, at around um, a value of around, just a little over a billion dollars. Um, the reason I was interested in it is because, of course, we're in a campaign context, and um, the uh, what, I, what, what did the uh, the Labor leader call it a pre-caretaker period, where we're approaching election campaign, and people are making claims, of course, about um, about all sorts of issues. The Prime Minister and uh, the Labor leader, and a number of um, uh, people from this House and people who want to be in, in the House and the Senate are in Darwin at the moment. It's the, the 80th anniversary of the bombing of Darwin, um, or the first bombing of Darwin. 250 or so Australians were killed at the, uh, during the Second World War. Um, and the Prime Minister said uh, on ABC Radio that 23,000, that since he had become Prime Minister, 23,000 contracts had gone, uh, Commonwealth contracts had gone to uh, Indigenous businesses. Um, uh, and if you add up the figures that you gave me over the course of the period, I, I, um, I think you can roughly get them to the sort of 23,000 figure. Um, but that, that the, the uh, the, the nominative figure is sounds like a big number, doesn't it? Twenty three thousand. Um, can can you confirm that that's right? Is it one point oh nine billion dollars as at September twenty twenty one assessment of the twenty 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 one financial year essentially? Uh, Senator, uh, yeah, one thousand one billion one hundred and one million for the twenty twenty one financial year. And so some of those contracts would be for, they would be substantial contracts worth, worth some millions of dollars and some of them would be very small contracts, wouldn't they? That would be correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, that $1.09 billion sounds like a lot of money to, um, to, to each of us. Um, can, are, are you aware of the, the size of Commonwealth expenditure in the 2020-21 financial year? Overall Commonwealth expenditure? Yeah. I'm not. I'm sorry, Senator, but we could... I can report to you <laughs> that it's uh, just over $654 billion. Um, so while that 23,000 figure, as, as I think uh, you, you reported... In fact, I think it was, um, it was you, Ms Fulton, who said that 10,000 figure is a substantial advance on the year before, and an advance on the year before that, and the year before that, starting from a very small base. It is just 0.17 per cent of Commonwealth expenditure, isn't it? If my um, Glen Innes High School maths are correct. Mm -hmm. Nice couple of maths. Oh, I would um, take your word for that sentence. There was, uh, I, could, I could work that out, but I will take your word on face value for that. A lot of great things come out of Glen Innes. Um, Tiny's Finito was a fantastic racehorse. Um, many other great products. Um, so 0.17 per cent. So we do, we, there, there's still plenty of room for improvement, isn't there? Senator, I would agree with that. I think though overall, the, the fact that we're seeing growth year on year, yes. we're heading in the right direction and, and we um, would hope to see that, that growth continue. Minister, what, why did the Prime Minister say 23,000 contracts under the period since I've become Prime Minister, as if he had something to do with it, and not honestly say to the people of the Northern Territory when he was on the radio, 0.17 per cent of Commonwealth expenditure? Um, I would suggest to you that neither formulation is false. But why did you use one and not the other? One, why, why did he one can describe um, the same information usually using a bunch of different ways um, and it's a matter of just personal preference. Personal preference or, or, 
what what suits um, a, a self-serving partisan story? Oh, um, Senator, I think that's a little bit disingenuous. The fact is that the supply and demand um, sides are both growing here, if I understand um, the information that's before me. Um, this is a good news story. Um, the Prime Minister is entitled to share that good news um, with Australians, and um, that's exactly what he did. There is nothing, um, nothing but proper communication involved in that. 0.17 per cent. He's just full of it, isn't it's he? It's the same information, Senator Ayres. He's just full of it. No, it's a fact. Facts are facts. That's all I have, Chair. I, I think Senator Dodson has a um, long block of... Well, it won't, be, it won't feel like it's long. Um, <laughs> but it, it, you're saying it's going to be... It'll, it'll take more than minutes. six minutes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just wonder whether the right thing to do, um, unless Coalition Senators have questions, whether... We, we do have a couple, um, but probably I, I better, really given that they're on the stuff. teleconference, better place to do it after lunch. So um, do we want to go to lunch now? Always late, but never late for lunch. So if, OK. Uh, could I, Madam Chair, could I just get one clarification? You on can, Senator percentages? Johnson. What portion of all of those figures pertain to the Northern Territory? I don't have that breakdown, I'm afraid, Senator. So it could be quite miserable. Well, or we could take on notice. It could so be why don't we take it on notice? We don't know, but you know, you're in the Northern Territory, and you're making a big announcement. What we'll portion has gone to the Northern Dodson. Territory? Senator Dodson will take it on notice. Good on you. I'm glad you do, Minister. If I could add, Senators, um, just going to that point of the proportion of overall spending, there is now a spending target, which is to reach. Um, 1.5 per cent of the value of contracts increasing to 3 per cent by 2027. So that's another incentive to increase the the value growth. Yeah, that, so that's um, so that's a sort of several several orders of magnitude away from where we are. Um, starting from a very low base, um, is there is there a um, is there a um, report that the agency or Supply Nation does that that provides those, you know, that, that um, against that baseline um, as a proportion of overall spending for the years that you gave me before? So we will track that. We rely on um, uh, agencies reporting to, yes. to us. So there's often a, a lag, but and the. Um, uh, the reporting is improving again year on year, so yeah. that remains a work in progress. But we will we will be tracking the. the and, and there's an issue, I suppose, of sort of working through how it is that you um, engage with the sort of quality uh, over the quantity of, in, in terms of the reporting. That is, what what are the size of the contracts? Um, you know, are they multiple contracts for essentially the same thing that are being you know? There's a series of metrics that are probably pretty difficult to grapple with, I suppose. Um, and, and we will learn over time yeah. more around that, yeah. you know, the, the, the industries, the, the breakdown and um, uh, geographic as well. Thanks, Ms Fulton. Appreciate it. Uh, Thank before you. We, before we break, um, Madam Chair, it might be helpful to also point out that, um, you know, we spend an average of um, $850 million in this space over the last six years. Um, that was 6.2 million in the year prior to us coming to government. Um, and so for all of the talk about the need for orders of magnitude of improvement for us to reach the goal that's been set um, for the medium term, um, it's important to acknowledge how much improvement there has been in recent times and how all of that improvement has happened under this government. I think... Um I think the important thing here is, you know, there is so much work to do across um, corporate Australia, um, across governments at the Commonwealth and state level. Um, I don't think anybody um, who's serious about uh, these issues would claim anything else. What is a problem is when people misrepresent what is going out there when people try and claim improvements that have been made when actually they're much smaller. Uh, and that diminishes the task for 
all of us uh, uh, and makes it actually harder um, to make progress. And people, they want to participate seriously in these debates, you know, need to actually be a bit fair dinkum about, about what they say to the Australian people about what's been achieved. Well, I'd suggest that's not a question, but um, in any event, um, it wasn't a question. An I freely concede that it was an acknowledgement. Another place for you to give speeches, <laughs> um, An acknowledgement Thanks, of the progress that has been made um, is real. The numbers have been accurately represented, mm. and the progress that has been made is a reflection of the fact that the minister has developed the national roadmap for indigenous jobs, skills, and wealth creation. It brings industry and governments together in a way that has never happened before, and it is transforming lives. And um, I will not step away from that. Very good. Um, despite promises that we'd finish a little bit early, we're just about bang on time now. <laughs> so I will um, oh, now suspend the committee for lunch and we will reconvene at 1.30pm and continue with the NIAA. Thank you very much, all. The committee will now um, reconvene and I'm just checking, I was hoping to give the call to a couple of coalition senators. I'm just checking whether, because um, we've got I'm them by video conference today, Senator whether Chandler, we have Senator O'Sullivan okay? on the call. Can you hear me okay? Uh, we can, Senator O'Sullivan. We might just get broadcasting to turn you up a little bit. Sorry, I'm... Uh I'm, I'm uh, just returned to Western Australia and I'm in quarantine and Wi-Fi is not great where I am, so I'm going to have to keep my video off. Uh, so, do you want me to just jump into it, Chair? Yes, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Senator Thank O'Sullivan. You. Thank you. I'd really love to get an update to uh, the NRAA on the employment programs and the reforms that are occurring in this whole space and uh, there's lots of programs that have sort of been wrapped up under under a new model. Can you just, uh, can I just get a general up, uh, overview and update on that? And I'll get into more specific questions. Uh, thank you, Senator. Could I just clarify, are you particularly interested in the Indigenous specific employment programs? So the Employment Parity Initiative, Tailored Assistance Grants Correct. and VITA? Yes, okay. So as you know, Senator, um, those are winding down over the course of this year yep. to be replaced in July with the new Indigenous Skills and Employment Program. That has, um, uh, we've in fact forecast on Grants Connect just to give um, interested providers a, a chance to look at getting ready to be able to um, uh, apply for that when, when it opens in coming months. We had a really good consultation phase around that program uh, through a series of well, with, with um, some COVID restrictions, we had a lot of virtual um, roundtables as well as uh, some face-to-face, -face, and we had a public discussion, uh, public submission uh, process as well. And we were fortunate to also have an independent evaluation of the existing program, so we felt like we had a really solid evidence base through that, which was, which was really helpful. So we've come up with a, a structure which allows, um, uh, consolidates the programs into one and it will be much more flexible and place-based. We're looking at having uh, uh, regional funding allocations based on relative need and we're going through a process to determine the, the priorities that each region wants to address through that, um, through that grant round with the intention that it can be a really partnership and collaboration oriented program working along mainstream programs, state and territory investment um, and the grants would be co-designed with communities once we open up that, once we open up that um, process. Okay, I'll come to the co-design aspects of it in a moment. So one of the things that I really thought was uh, uh, quite innovative and, and, and effective with the mm -hmm. previous program, I you know, definitely support consolidation and bringing things together to make it clearer for community and, and for providers. Uh, but one of the things that I thought was really good was the focus on outcomes rather than necessarily activities, I suppose. So, so particularly in, in the employment space. So, so employment, uh, actually commencement into a job and importantly retention in the job. We know that uh, um, there's with a lot of these programs, there can be real focus on just getting people 
engaged and you know going to training courses and doing all these things but you know the real outcome that matters is someone getting a job and then sustaining in the job so does it still have that focus particularly around outcome payments and that sort of thing what can you tell me a little bit about the design that you're looking at Yes, Senator. So what we um, are expecting to see in the new program is, is a bit of a balance. So we heard a lot through the consultations and also through the evaluation that we needed to be able to create a bit more flexibility to meet individual job seekers where they were um, and accept that sometimes that might need quite a long period of support pre-placement and potentially quite a lot of support um, after a 26-week period as well. So as you know, we relied very heavily on a 26-week employment outcome as a, um, a strong measure of success. So we would expect to uh, continue to be interested in that, but continue to but be more interested in longer-term outcomes and tracking transition pathways better. And we um, would also probably build in a little more around qualitative assessments as well. So try to get a sense of what collaboration there's been, um, the quality of mentoring services and the like. So we'll, we should have a more comprehensive set of um, performance metrics in the new program. Okay. And, uh, and so is that, that change is reflecting the fact that uh, many job seekers are on a bit of a journey uh, some are, some might be job ready, suitable to take up a job. Others might have possibly significant and multiple barriers to employment, so they might need a little bit more work to prepare. Uh, is it sort of reflecting that so that the, the program's more flexible to actually help address the needs that individual job seekers have rather than just looking at them as an entire cohort? That, that's right, Senator, and that we would um, hope to have the new program work uh, very collaboratively with existing mainstream services as well. So uh, rather than working uh, in a complementary but sort of side by side way, they could potentially work in a more collaborative way. So um, there might be, for example, the um, uh, new employment services model might be providing a range of specialist support, but there are still gaps that that model has some constraints around and that our program would be able to be more flexible to, to provide the kind of support that an individual needs. Still with an eye to employment, but taking a, a, a recognition, as you say, that people might have quite a, you know, um, quite different paths to, to get there and that we would also want to look at um, career, career advancement as well, so not just to focus on um, uh, being placed in a job, staying there for a while, but keeping a longer term outlook on, on their journey. Okay. And what, uh, I imagine these programs are complementary to the mainstream programs still. So uh, are there any extra steps being taken to make sure that those uh, mainstream providers, are, you know, if I can be sort of rude about it, like, you know, not let off the hook, uh, they're going to get their outcome payments, uh, whether they do any work or not, uh, whether they've actually contributed to the outcome or not. Um, but are they uh, are they really being held? Is it complementary, and are they really being drawn in here so that they actually are part of that process, particularly if the Commonwealth is paying for them to support job seekers? We would anticipate that that is the case. Obviously, we still are awaiting the um, the commencement of the new. Um, mainstream in yeah. non-remote uh, from July, so there'll be a range of things to work in progress through, but we're in close discussions with the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, and uh, we are looking at how we can have, um, at regional level, a, a kind of a um, steering committee of key stakeholders to, to look at how um, progress is going through our program and how that's collaborating with, with others. So we do expect that everybody that's achieving an outcome has, has worked for that outcome. Okay, and just finally on this topic, what about the uh, what's the time frames that you're working to, uh, to to see it fully rolled out? So we are hoping we are going through the process at the moment of finalising grant opportunity guidelines, and they'll need to go through an approval process. Um, in the meantime, we've forecast the a forthcoming opportunity on Grants Connect, so that interested providers can start to 
um, keep an eye out. And we are hoping to be able to open that opportunity in, in coming months um, and start with an expression of interest phase for organisations to um, uh, give us an initial indication of their um, expertise and experience and what they're interested in doing. And then we would plan to shortlist from there and invite those shortlisted organisations to prepare a full proposal and ready to implement from the second half of the year. Excellent. Uh, Chair, have I got a few more minutes? Can I, can I just ask something else? Um, yeah. You may quickly, Senator O'Sullivan. I'm, I'm just not sure whether we have Senator McMahon on the line as well. I do know she wanted to ask some questions in this section, but if she's not appearing on the video conference, I'll let okay. you continue, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. OK, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, the, I'm just wondering if you can just give us an update on where we're at with the CDP or the trials. Um, with the, the new, uh, is it four or five new regions, or uh, regions that have been earmarked for co-design and development of a uh, different model? Yes, Senator. So I think you would be aware that the trial sites were announced by the minister last year around about October. Uh, since then, we have, through our regional presence, been working with um, uh, stakeholders in each region to identify uh, Indigenous organisations and communities and, and other stakeholders who could participate in a local co-design group. Um, we're still receiving um, RSVPs for participating in those local groups. Um, in fact, I think the closing date for that is today. Uh, and then we'll be looking to hold the first meeting of each local co-design group uh, in, uh, in coming weeks and work the process through from there. There are, um, the, the trial regions are all at quite different stages. So for example, uh, Palm Island in far north Queensland are really managing a, a range of challenges around COVID at the moment. So they've asked us to just wait a bit. Um, uh, so we're working at the paces that the, the different regions are asking for, but will be progressing in coming weeks. And the first meeting of those local co-design groups will really set their, their um, ground rules, for want of a better term, around how they'll work, what pace, what decisions they're expecting to take um, through the co-design process. So has there been any uh, commencement of any co-design or still sort of co-designing the co-design? Where, where are we actually at in terms of sitting down and working out the way forward? Uh, in terms of working out the way forward at the trial site regions, that is still um, working through the um, preparatory arrangements. We have had a public submission process to get feedback from uh, any interested um, stakeholder. And those submissions are, I believe, now on the NIAA website where authors have agreed that they can be made public. We've also had um, a range of discussions with different providers to, to get views as well. So we're starting to get some feedback, but at the trial at the trial level, we're still at the early preparatory stages. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Chair, back to you. Thank you very much, Senator O'Sullivan. I might give the call to Senator Dodson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I might just pick up where Senator O'Sullivan left off on the CDP, and then I'll come back to the voice. Is that OK? Um, the, you said there were submissions, you've sought submissions. How many submissions have come in? Uh, I believe it was 33, right? Yes. Thirty-three. And the allocation for this over five years was what, one hundred and eleven million? There was a hundred and eleven million provided, but it was um, to address the increase in CDP caseload uh, and the costs of the tr pilot trials are absorbed within the IAS, but that additional $111 million was to um, uh, cover the, the increased caseload. I believe there was a... Um, Ms Phipps might be able to elaborate the, the components of that. I believe some of it was for other agencies. Uh, 
Kate Fuchs, Branch Manager, Remote Employment Policy Task Force. Uh, that is correct, as Ms Fulton has said. There were a number of different components to, to that amount. Um, I'd have to take the details on notice, Senator. Okay, I didn't quite catch that. I'm hard of hearing at this end of the village, but uh, if, you, if you just... Uh, how much... If you give me the diversity where the funds have been split across. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll take it on, you oh, know, actually, take it on notice, give it to me when you've got it. I can actually do that for you, sorry. My folder fell open and I now couldn't find it, but my colleagues just brought it to me. So um, that was uh, 111 million of which, um, uh, oh, I can't even read it without my glasses now. So uh, Department of Social Services was receiving um, a proportion of that. There was a small amount going to education, skills and employment, um, the bulk of it coming to NIAA for the CDP um, caseload costs and an amount to Services Australia. Okay. So a range of processing. And there, there are uh, six trial sites that have been nominated? Uh, yes. And in, I think it's um, uh, five, five so sites, but six yeah, uh, regions, six is that right? Yeah. Six regions? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Okay. So you might tell me that... So how many providers within the six regions are you looking at? Uh, so, Senator, within uh, those six uh, regions, we have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven providers. Seven providers. Um, and the ones in Western Australia, is, is that the northwest? Is, is, that, is uh, that the region? So in, in our Western Australia, it's Midwest. Midwest. And Nunundurra. And Nunundurra. Okay. Um, these trials are meant to start at the end of this year, is that right? Uh, so, Senator, the uh, trials will start following a period of co design with um, the local co design groups. Uh, so we expect it will vary across the different regions. The, is there a, a nominal starting time of July? Was there, didn't the minister say they were going to start in July? Uh, we're expecting uh, that uh, we will start very soon, Senator, and that it could take approximately six months. So I think that's what the minister was referring to. And, the, and when the total start-up for the pro for, to complete co-design, get the advisory body in the place, do all those things. When was this supposed to start? Sorry, is it when? Well, when's the new actual process or program meant to start? Is that in 2003? Uh, so, yes, 2023 is the start. 2023, so it's a long time away. It's a long time away for, you know, such a promise. Um, the, there was a change to the circumstances, wasn't there, to these, in these trial sites, so the mutual obligation component was no longer obligatory, is that right? Uh, Senator, that doesn't um, apply only to the trial sites. That was a change to CDP... Across in, the board? Across the board in, in May last year. OK. So what's been the consequence of that for attendance? So we have seen um, that attendance at activities has dropped as a result of uh, that change, but it's, uh, it had also dropped as a result of um, uh, mutual obligation suspension a result of, as a result of COVID-19. So there are a range of factors at play, but uh, we have seen a, a drop in attendance. That's certainly true. And, and has there been any financial adjustments to the providers on the basis of the drops? The providers are continuing to provide a range of support and they're continuing to arrange um, activities for job seekers as well. Their payments are remaining broadly steady. Um, if I can find it. Uh, the, so they're receiving uh, fee-for-service outcome-based payments as well, and they're broadly steady. So uh, are they likely to be getting a windfall out of this? Drop-off in numbers? The maintenance of their contracted entitlements? And no change to their 
financial motives. Is that, is that what I'm understanding? Uh, I don't believe that would be correct, Senator. The caseload is still high, so CDP providers are still providing to support to every job seeker on that caseload. They're still required to engage with them, support them with job plans, support them in um, uh, mentoring and support services and job placement, and they will arrange activities that job seekers will indicate that they plan to attend. So they're, um, they're still providing that, that suite of services. But didn't you say that there's been a drop off because of COVID and there's other been factors? A uh, maybe I wasn't very clear. So there's been a drop off in um, attendance at activities, but that's just one component. Okay. So, and there's no no adjustment to the providers. Well, the providers um, uh, will arrange activities on the expectation that people will attend. So they're still putting. Well, that if they're not attending, how can you arrange something? <laughs> Deb, I'm happy to. Um, Senator Kate Elliott, um, Remote Employment Programs and Implementation Branch. Um, so, as Ms Faulkner was saying, um, CDP payments are actually demand driven and outcomes based. So, the CDP provider is being paid based on the caseload in terms of the number of job seekers they're servicing. So, right. they have that servicing payment. They have activity attendance payments, which to do, which respond to when a job seeker agrees to attend an activity, and then they also have the outcome payments for 13-week and 26-week outcomes, where those providers provide post-placement support to support that job seeker in their pathway into employment. So, so the cash flow operates like a float in a trough. If it goes up, it gets off. You get your maximum. If it drops down. You know, nothing's happening. Um, and so, Senator, of course, at the moment we have 30% um, higher caseload due to COVID-19, and so our service providers are working very proactively with job seekers to adapt service delivery um, based on those jurisdictional requirements. So, of course, they're looking at alternative service delivery models and also that outreach to job seekers. So they're working very hard in those communities to continue that contact through the program. So, so how much community development um, activity is happening? Um, Senator, there's a range of different activities that are happening throughout the program. Um, so, you know, we're hearing um, through our providers that they're, you know, they're still engaging very closely with, with job seekers. There are some job seekers still participating in income support activities. So, you know, you know, doing art, art and looking at business and enterprise development. There's you know, a broad range of different activities that are happening on the ground. Um, I do have some examples here, sorry, I just... But you're not paying them for no activities? That's no, not, there's definitely I activities going... Yeah, They're across. not getting a windfall of the public sector, no. Yep, so the, the service providers are still delivering activities for job seekers to participate in, and obviously that participation is being impacted at the moment with the various jurisdictional requirements due to COVID-19. Okay. Um, and, and has there been any variation in the in the contracts or the deeds that engage these providers? Um, Senator, not not at the moment. As I said, it is a demand based and outcomes payment right. model. So right. the the payment mod model is still appropriate for the program at the moment. Okay. So the, the new employment model, is, how is that meant to, I suppose, enable? the participation of people who have a choice here. They're either going to participate or not participate. So what happens? This is, this is not turning up for the activity. Then there's no penalty for it. There's still a range of um, things that job seekers need to do. They still need to engage with the provider. They need to develop a jobs plan, um, attend uh, jobs appointments, so the activities is one component, um, but they still need to uh, participate in, in, in the range of support that the CDP provider can put Okay, forward. so you've got a, seven, I think you said, providers within the trial area, the seven... Uh, yes. You've got seven so, providers within that. What's the conversation going on with the providers outside of this experiment? Well, uh, just to be clear, these changes that um, uh, Ms Elliott's been talking through reply to all of CDP, including CDP in those trial areas. Once the um, co-design has been 
for the trials is developed, then we would expect there to be a change for the um, job seekers in those trials. But that will um, depend on the, the outcome of the code design so process. I just want to be clear that the experimentation is restricted to, a, to seven regions, or five regions, what is it, five regions? So it's restricted to that, pro that area, and there are seven providers within it. Outside of there, I don't know how many providers you've got, but, and I'm getting the impression that you're saying that whatever happens in this trial area is also happening in the mainstream of it. Is that correct or is that not correct? No, I might have um, been a bit confusing in how I put it forward. So the changes to mutual obligation requirements to make activities voluntary, that's happening right across CDP, all 60 right. regions, which includes those trial regions. What we would expect to see after a period of co-design in those trial regions is they might have um, some slightly different arrangements in place. Which will continue to um, uh, involve vocational and non-vocational support and, and uh, job seeker placement support, but they will work through uh, different ways that they would like to see a new remote engagement program work. We'll learn from that. In the meantime, until they're ready to start implementing a trial, they're treated the same as all of the, um, the all of the CDP regions. Okay, so and you haven't yet nominated the people to guide the trial process, the co-design process? Uh, so we have written uh, to three of the trial sites to um, seek nominations for people to participate. Those are still coming in at the moment. Okay. And when is the, the close-off date for that? Today. Today. And what did you say? You had 34 applications? Uh, Ms Phipps. Uh, so I think uh, the 34, Senator, was 34 submissions to our national, uh, the first phase of our national consultation process. Okay, and they'll advise you on all of the regions and it's, it's not an advisory entity for each of the, 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 that, the, the locations? That's right, Senator. So we are planning to have three layers uh, to make sure that everyone who wants to participate across the country can. So the consultation process uh, is open to anyone who would like to put in a submission. Uh, the co-design, as we've discussed, is across uh, six regions. Uh, and we also are intending, once the local co-design groups are established, to then establish a national co-design group that can look across uh, both the learnings from the co-design groups and also the national consultation process. To, to look at what what are the best uh, settings for the new program. Okay, so all of those providing a service now, have they got a contract period with a terminus on it, or when, uh, do, the, when do their contracts expire? So, so their contracts are at this uh, their contracts expire on the thirtieth of June, uh, twenty twenty three. Twenty twenty three. Twenty twenty three. Twenty twenty three. Okay. And subject to the outcomes from these experiments, you'll draw new contracts, I presume? Uh, so following uh, the outcomes from co-design, yep, we will uh, determine a new process. Okay. All right, thank, thank you for that. Can I just move on to the voice? Yes, you may, Senator Thanks. Watson, quickly. I don't know whether you need any new players up there on the front bench. Notice, uh, Ms. Bruin, you made some passing comments to the voice in your table statement, um, but I'm not. I'm not coming to you. I'm just re acknowledging that you did make some yep. passing comment here. So, if I haven't quite understood it by these questions, and I'm seeking some enlightenment. So, has the government commenced the discussions with the states and the territories on the local and regional voice arrangements? And I understand from your comments that you have. Yes. Is that right? Yes. And when did those discussions start and when are they likely to terminate so that some action might happen here? I can perhaps start with that, Senator. So Julianne Guevara, the Group Manager for Strategic Policy Group. 
in an IAA. Um, as you know, Senator, the, uh, the final report was released on the 17th of December. Um, that report uh, followed quite a lengthy and extensive consultation across Australia with over 9,400 people participating. Um, the report is forming the basis for the discussions that we are having, of course, with um, state and territory governments. Of course, the government at the time of releasing the report indicated that it would now begin with those first steps on local and regional voice. Uh, we have had now three separate discussions with senior officials, so one in December, uh, one earlier this month, and uh, in fact one just two days ago. <laughs> so um, the Minister too, of course, has had uh, an opportunity to speak to his uh, state and territory counterparts at the Indigenous Affairs Task Force uh, earlier this week. Okay, and you've been meeting with the local government authorities as well? So, in, indeed, when the Minister uh, had his uh, uh, meetings earlier this week, uh, uh, ALGA was a representative there. And, Senator, they're also on the senior officials group yeah. as well. Okay. So, things are moving along nicely, are they? Uh, Senator, as you uh, no doubt appreciate, I mean, it is a very complex exercise that we're about to embark on in terms of the next steps for the establishment of local and regional voices. Uh, the government, of course, has committed to a co-design process, not only with state and territory governments and, and local government there, but also with local indigenous communities as well. So um, uh, it, it will, uh, you know, we anticipate that it will be a, a lengthy process, but it will be, uh, you know, qu quite a, a detailed range of discussions that we'll have with, with them going forward. Okay, so the, so you're confident you'll meet the time frame of the 1st of July 2022 for the rollout of the regional and local uh, voices? Uh, uh, Senator, I think what the government has committed to obviously is, is working in partnership and certainly the minister has indicated this to his state and territory uh, counterparts that the government is, is very uh, committed to the co-design effort um, and so that may take some time as we only just embarked of course on uh, uh, you know, the commencement of this, this exercise. So um, I think we're really, as the Minister said, the, the main focus is really trying to ensure that we, we get the design process right. Yeah, we wouldn't want to hurry this, would we? I mean, it's three years since the Minister said we'll have a voice and it will be legislated. And three years also he said we'll have a referendum. So I'd hate to see some speed going on here. In fairness to the witnesses, there's a real tension between the desire to... There's a real to... tension, all right, Minister. Can I finish, Senator please, <laughs> Senator, um, Senator Dodson? Um, there's a tension between the desire to um, achieve outcomes and the desire to ensure buy-in and make sure everybody feels heard, everybody has um, the feeling of ownership that's necessary for it to succeed. You of all people know that that consensus based model for no, decision so making well. is really important. And so we are adopting that out of respect for the communities that we want to really own and participate and get the most out of this so that it can achieve its purpose of um, kicking all of those closing the gap targets. Yes, well, you shouldn't tell the public you're going to meet something by a certain date because we tend to take that literally and we hold you to the promise. You know that, Minister. So if the rollout of these regional and local uh, voices uh, are meant to take place on the 1st of July 2022, I understand there's complexities and challenges, but that's the date that was set by the minister and we'd expect this is when this will happen, not drift on to the never, never land. In the last estimates, uh, you confirmed, I think, that there's 7.5 million allocated to the co-design process. Now, I'm not sure whether you're the right person to deal with this, but whomever is. So my colleague, Robert Ryan, who's the branch seven, manager seven responsible three. for responding Robert, to that You're going to deal with this? Question. Good on you, Robert. <laughs> um, so there was 7.5 million allocated to the co-design process. Is that right? Uh, 7.3 million. 7.3? Mm. You knocked off a bit of dough. No, no, it's always been 7.3, Senator. Cut, cut it back, we weren't looking. <laughs> it's always um, been 7.3. And so, well, tell me, is this? Right, over 3.5 million has been spent. Is that right, or more? 
Uh, no, the funding of 7.3 million has been fully expended on the co-design process. Fully expended? Fully expended. So what's going to fund the co-design process now? Um, well, that, that'll be part of the, process, the budget process to actually get uh, further funding. So there's no money to fund it now? Uh, well, I, I'm not saying that, Senator. I'm saying the 7.3 million that was made available for the co-design of a voice, that, that exercise is completed. Now we're into implementation, which will also involve co-design, and we'll, we'll need to resource that as well. But that's separate from the 7.3 million. So, so how much is the supply of funds impost on getting things done? In terms of this work, I mean yeah. that, that's that's something we're looking at currently. Looking at in terms of uh, what, <laughs> what budget distance, is required yeah? for this. From what work. distance? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're looking at it closely, but it's part of the budget process. Part it? of the budget process. All right. Well, that's in a few weeks' time. I want to know what that is. Um, so, what's? I suppose it's a bit hard to tell me what um, what this is going to cost going going forward because you've got it in a budget process and I presume that's only the Minister knows that and you guys don't, understand, don't uh, have no privilege to tell me. So we look forward to that because this, this is becoming a fairly ex, you know, expensive exercise uh, to, to choose and I, I accept what the Minister says about getting things right and getting it proper, I understand all of that. But this goes back to John Howard when he was, a, you know, was the Prime Minister in this place. And a, few, and a few years before that. But in fairness, um, Prime Minister Howard put it to a referendum. It didn't succeed. Um, and we really do want to make sure that um, the lessons of that period are understood and built upon and to make sure that things are done properly. Um, that consultation is really vital and um, we absolutely continue um, to intend to work closely with local councils, with local groups um, and with other governments to make sure this is something sustainable and effective. Good. I'm glad to hear that, Minister. Um, I think I had a black beard when this started, but, you know, I'm happy to... You look beautiful and, and white. I'm happy to sit here and listen to you <laughs> say how long it's It's taken. a very nice beard, just as it is, Senator Dodson. <laughs> so what's the process for the national voice? Are we, are we going to wait until the regional and local voices are all signed off, ticked off, and uh, put into legislation? Or what, what's, the, what's the game with the national voice? Well, the short answer is yes. Um, we are focused on delivering local and regional voices because that's the level at which the most important metrics um, of improving the lives of Indigenous Australians um, will come through. Uh, that's where we have the opportunity to have the biggest impact on the closing the gap targets. It's where we have the biggest opportunity for genuine and consistent input from people and communities. We will deal with the question of a national voice once the local and regional voices are better down, achieving their goals, um, and only then will we take the next step because um, it is very important that this is done right and it is done sustainably so that it can have the, the effect that I know you and I both want it to achieve. But it's not what the report told you. The report told you to progress the national voice. Well, it is Almost simultaneously or concurrent with the progress of the local and regional voices. Respectfully, it is progress to make sure um, that things aren't being um, slapped together, to make sure that things uh, aren't it's, being it's not, aren't respect, in conflict Minister. or at cross purposes. It's asked and you to the, walk and chew gum. But if the do two things at once: the regional be, voice Senator and the Johnson. national voice. Order. If you Senators. want an answer from me, let me give it. Well, give me an answer to the I'm question. I'm trying to. If you could stop speaking over me, I'd be able to. Oh, please. Oh, I have a little <laughs> bit of courtesy, Senator Dodson. Um, you know what the question is. And I'm trying to answer it, Senator Dodson. We can go round and round like this all day, or I can just answer the question. Um, I don't mind going all day. I'm not going that. anywhere. So I can't get home to Western Australia for another week. It's your time. <laughs> um, when you're ready, I'll answer the question. Are you ready now? Ask the chair. Well, I'm asking you. Don't ask me. Ask the chair. I, I think the minister was in the process of answering your question, <laughs> Senator Dodson, Thank before, you, chair. before you started playing over games. each other. Now, um, our intention is to progress 
a national voice, but we will do it in the sequential path that was set out by the co-design committee. The co-design committee made it very clear that the first step for effectiveness, the first step for long-term improvement uh, was in the local and the regional space. Um, and so we are fulfilling to the letter uh, that which was designed by the co-design group over an 18-month period. Um, we will follow that report and uh, we will build a national voice from there. Can I speak now? Okay, thank well, you. I finished my answer. So yes, thank you. you wish. I wasn't sure there was a pregnant pause there. I wasn't sure whether you'd finished. Can I ask then, you obviously are committed to the national voice. Is that, is that, you, you may be taking time to get there, but you are committed to it. Is that the position? Senator Dodson, um, we've committed to option two of the um, co-design process and um, that entails everything it entails. Okay. All right, well, if the, if the um, process to get the regional and local voices into existence is, doesn't look like happening until after the 1st of July 2022 this year, because of all the other things that have been said here, when is it expected you might start the work on the national voice? Okay. Um, Senator Dodson, the estimates of timing in the report, um, the ones to which you have just referred, um, are always on the basis of negotiations going um, according to their estimated time. Um, the process is underway and uh, Ms Guevara can speak more to that. Um, but it would be contrary to principles um, that we've heard about already today, about self-determination and about consent and all of that, um, if we weren't to genuinely and sincerely see that consultation phase through to completion. I'll hand over to you. Um, Thank you, Minister. Ms Guevara. Um, just in terms of details, I mean, obviously, as I said at the outset, the, the negotiations with states and territories will be quite a complex exercise. There are a number of things that you would appreciate, Senator, that we have to go through, including how this would interact with existing mechanisms that <coughs> some states and territories may actually have. Um, those things around potentially sort of looking at funding related arrangements. The report obviously speaks to some of the elements around how you go about designing regions, etc. Um, all of that we obviously have to walk through very uh, carefully with, with state and territory governments over the course of the uh, next few months. Um, as I said, we've already had three meetings at that senior officials level. We've committed to having uh, more intensive meetings, in fact, over the next uh, month with a number of them on a bilateral basis. So we do have a, a plan of action um, going forward, uh, which, you know, as I said, will walk through all of the very sort of complex range of issues that were sort of identified in that, in that final report. OK, so when all the ducks are lined up and achieved in terms of the regional and local voices, is it the intention then to legislate those regional entities into existence or wait until the process to deal with the national voice uh, completed, whenever they, they might be completed? I might let my colleague uh, Robert Ryan respond to that. Um, Senator, so at this stage we really are sort of just taking the first step around negotiation with the states and territories and the Australian Local Government Association. Local and regional voices will be voices to all levels of government. So to date, while we've had a senior officials group, it's been the Commonwealth that has sort of um, supported and enabled this process through the co-design members. But we now have to pivot to where we are working with the states and territories and with the Australian Local Government Association. So, you know, we need to get through that process to get that full sign up from all the levels of government uh, to actually support local and regional voices before we probably get to making decisions about you know, what form of, um, you know, whether, that, whether you require legislation around local and regional voices uh, and those other issues. But certainly that the report does provide some direction for us on that. Okay. 
Right, well, I, uh, I'm sure there's a thousand and one other questions I could ask Madam Chair, but I can see this is such a long process in gestation. We're going to be here on many occasions having similar discussions. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, before you go to the next block, yes. can I take this opportunity to um, correct some figures that I put of on course, the record a little Minister, bit earlier? Yes. I would, wouldn't want to leave the committee um, without accurate data. Indeed. Um, when we were talking about the Indigenous Procurement mm. Program, um, there were some numbers being shared about um, the number of contracts and the, and the spend involved. In the 2020 to 21 um, Oz tender process, um, there was $69.8 billion in Commonwealth procurement, which was 84,054 contracts. Um, now, that indicates a number of about 1.5% um, of spend, and that reflects the fact that we are now 50% of the way to meeting the 2027 goal. 2027 target. Just wanted to make sure that was very clear because um, it differs slightly to the numbers um, that the committee was supplied with earlier. Very good. Thank you, yeah, Minister. Just um, two things. Um, That's correct, isn't it? The, can you just, uh, which, which of the two options for the national voice is the government going to adopt from the report? Option so two. Option two. Um, uh, and of course, um, I don't want to go around in circles about this uh, issue um, for, forever. Um, I think I think the government agrees that Austender is um, uh, doesn't capture the entirety of Commonwealth expenditure uh, on contracting for goods and services. Um, it's a tool for businesses to use. Um, and I think in the, in fact, in this committee, we've spent a little bit of time on, um, on Austender and um, if it was to be used as a, as a basis for data collection and measuring what's happened in government uh, contracting, I think everybody who's spent any time with it agrees it's not really for that purpose. It's really a, um, I think even Department of Finance concedes imperfect tool for allowing b businesses to access uh, Commonwealth tenders. Um, I don't care with and, that and only And only some Commonwealth tenders uh, go through that process. Senator Ayres, um, I don't cover with that proposition. Um, I think that's um, something I'm happy to um, accept given your people who have been on this committee over the course of the examination of that matter in, in this week. Um, what I would suggest though, is that if your proposition is correct, um, then the number can only actually be higher, not lower. No, because the, because the, the, um, the uh, um, denominator will expand um, as, <coughs> as more uh, contracts are included uh, in it. Um, now, the numerator may expand a little bit, but um, that is indeed unknown at this point in time. And I think the discussion that we had earlier that um, is means that... Um, the, uh, that is, the total amount of contracts may uh, may uh, be much larger than the number that's covered by Austender. Anyway, um, I um, might just to close the loop on that. We might just hand over to very um, Ms. Fulton. To close it. Yes. Um, just to make sure that we've got the best possible information, then we might leave it. Thank you, Senator. So I think really what we wanted to do was just um, clarify with the the figures that you'd proposed earlier, which actually captured. Uh, a much wider range of Commonwealth expenditure, including things like Commonwealth to state and territory transfers and yeah, um, social sure. security. So it was yeah. just to kind of try to have a, a closer approximation of like for like around the value of Commonwealth contracts through Oz tender and the value of um, contracts reported through IP. And I would be interested over time in hearing more about you know how that that uh, 2030 target 20 2020 2027 uh, target. You know how that will be derived. It's, I think it's an important issue, and we ought to we ought to um, have a clear Watch public that. understanding of what that is about. The um, so option two. Back to option two. I, I'm told uh, by a colleague that that option two says the establishment of a voice by 2024. 
with a body to, to support the establishment of a voice by 2023, Minister, is the government still committed to that time frame? Um, that is still our anticipated time frame. It seems, <coughs> I mean, I was in and out a bit, um, but I listened carefully when I was here. It seemed improbable. Okay, anyway, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Um, I don't think any other senators have questions for the NIAA, so thank you very much for coming along today and for staying with us for an extra 20 minutes to get through those questions. Um, and we'll now bring on the Department of Health. We'll have some of them. Oh, I'm sure they anticipated that you would put some questions on notice, Senator Dodson. No, I'm still here. I don't know whether they. Hello. Um, I'd like to welcome Ms Tanya Rishnu, Deputy Secretary, Primary and Community Care Group at the Department of Health and other officers to, oh, you have joined, uh, officers of the National Indigenous Australians Agency for this session on Indigenous health issues. Ms Rishnu, did you wish to make an opening statement? No, uh, Tanya Rishnu, Deputy Secretary, Primary and Community Care Group. Thanks, Chair. Just uh, an acknowledgement that we meet today on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Very good. I'm looking to Labor senators as to who would like the call. Senator Dodson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in the um, and thank you for the work that you're doing, despite the questions I might ask over here. Right. <laughs> thank you, Senator. You, you're doing a marvellous job in, in the space, up, up against many things. Um, but how many First Nations peoples have uh, died from COVID? Uh, across the country. Have you, have you got figures on that? Uh, I'll ask Lock, uh, Dr Detoka to, to go through the figures. Senator, thank you. And, and how many of them have occurred uh, from the Omicron, whatever it is, the <coughs> la latest version of the virus? Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Ms Rishnu. Uh, Dr Lucas Detoka, First Citizen Secretary, Implementation and Primary Care Response in the National COVID Vaccine Task Force and the Department of Health. Um, with that out of the way, um, thanks, Senator. So, um, sadly, to date, in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been 68 uh, First Nations people okay. um, um, identified as uh, um, in, in the registers as uh, dying uh, or a COVID-19 associated death. So, 68 since the beginning of the pandemic, um, and uh, sadly, 43 of those have been this calendar year. Uh, that's associated with the Omicron uh, outbreak. The uh, rate of death among the overall number of cases uh, remains lower than in general population. Okay, now, I'm not sure where I've seen this, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, it may have come from the agency, the NIAA, but, but, but the first, the amount of Aboriginal people who've got the first dose they say it's about 82 per cent. If these figures are wrong, just correct them and tell me what they are. And that the second dose, those with the second dose nationally, is 77 per cent. But they didn't say how many have got the third dose. So are any of those figures correct? If they're not, can you correct them? And if you know what the third dosage percentage is, appreciate knowing that. Thank you, Senator. They're, they're broadly correct, um, but um, the rounding I could have gone one up, but up it's 82.8 per cent first dose, 77.7 uh, per cent second dose. This is nationally, and out of um, 
people who are eligible for a booster, because as you know, you become eligible for a booster three months after um, your primary course, 45.6% uh, have had a booster. And have you got the breakdown on the jurisdictions for that? Um, yep. So for first and second dose, um, the Australian Capital. Maybe if you just, ta can you table them? We can table them. And particularly I'm interested in Western Australia and the north. So just, just so you know, Senator, so Western Australia has improved um, quite a lot in the last couple of months, um, still behind national average, but um, on first dose, they're at, they are at 79.9%. And on second dose, because it's trailing, because of course the first dose increases are relatively recent, um, the WA is on 68.7%. Well, I understand there was a surge workforce that was detailed to go around and help encourage people or mm -hmm. inject people to, to get the vaccines. So is that workforce still in existence or is it gone? Um, absolutely, uh, Senator, and I'm just pulling up WA-specific um, numbers. But uh, yes, so there, there's been a number of rounds of uh, and mechanisms of health workforce to support um, ACHOs, and uh, Mr Matthews can talk about uh, their broader workforce support that the Australian government has provided to ACHOs, but specifically in the vaccine space, uh, we have been providing additional support to health services through a number of avenues. Uh, the most common one is through the Vaccine Administration Service uh, Program that now is called the Vaccine Administration Partners uh, Program, the VAP, as we call it. Um, and the VAP has been providing support for workforce either embedded within ACHOs or working in, in conjunction in parallel to ACHOs um, for a number of months um, at the moment with a focus on the 30 LGAs of, of priority that uh, General Fruin's acceleration plan included in September, um, and that activity has continued throughout um, all the past few months, and uh, currently we have VAP teams embedded within Aboriginal Community Control Health Services and other services in, in quite a number of locations, including WA, with work orders in place uh, well into the next few months, um, including deployments planned for... So, so they are being ramped up, are they? Or in, say, in the Pilbara, the Kimberley, uh, Gascoigne regions, are these forces being ramped up? Because you, you know what's happening in the Territory. Mm -hmm. you, you've got some prediction plan somewhere what's going to happen to us in the, in the West. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we have, uh, we have those workforces augmenting uh, services in, in WA. We currently have um, um, the Chuchunjara um, had Healthcare Australia, which is one of the VAP providers, um, allocated and they have a request for four weeks. Uh, Halls Creek uh, will have uh, a VAP team from the 1st of March. Um, Broome has also put in a request that we're working with uh, and we're expanding the number of available providers to provide that ongoing support. There's a clear commitment from all partners in WA, um, the ACHOs, Aqua, uh, WAX, WA Health and us uh, to make sure that we make the most of the time we have until uh, the inevitable um, um, Omicron wave that will, will, will happen in WA to keep the, the rates up. And there was significant effort the other side of uh, last year um, that we are continuing and expanding, including with additional VAP deployments in those areas. VAP is only one of the mechanisms. We also have the Royal Flying Doctor Service uh, providing um, augmentation of capacity, both in the response, swap transfer, respiratory clinic space, but also in the vaccination um, space. Um, and there's also in, in other areas has been, as you know, in Western Sydney or parts of the Northern Territory has been uh, Australian Defence Force supplementation of the vaccination workforce as well. And Senator, as, as Dr Detoka has mentioned, particularly over the last two months, we've seen a significant uptake in WA in particular, which is really mm. pleasing. Yeah, from zero to anything, it'll be good there. <laughs> We're working hard on it, Senator. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, but I, I, these are all relative things. So when did the Commonwealth start providing the RAP uh, uh, packages um, to the ACHOs in Western Australia? Or have they started providing those? Y yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. So um, the uh, Australian government, I'm just getting the dates for you, sorry, Senator. Uh, so the Australian government announced um, the uh, commitment to providing at, uh, rats for rapid antigen tests for Aboriginal Community Control Health Services for uh, staff screening on the 25th of January. And that week, um, both uh, the Tuesday and the Thursday of that week, the dispatches commence for all um, Aboriginal Community Control Health Services in the country. Uh, deliveries uh, have been ongoing uh, throughout the last couple of weeks, including some um, 
delaying some of the deliveries in WA and NT because of the floods and the interruption of road transport, uh, particularly from South Australia. But we have been working really closely with any affected ACHO uh, to make sure that there were alternative uh, supplies if required. Um, and now the immense majority of ACHOs have received all their Commonwealth initial allocation and the ones um, who remain outstanding, uh, we've worked with them and the jurisdictional authorities to make sure that they had the supply they need. And now the Commonwealth is committed to providing also additional supplies to facilitate community testing particular remote communities, but across all their client population within the ACHOs. Um, and we are now providing direct uh, supply from the National Medical Stockpile, and we are going to do it in a preposition uh, four weeks at a time um, deployment so that the ACHOs have more, more than enough to cover um, their operations ongoing, and we don't rely on weekly, um, weekly, on weekly deliveries. Mm -hmm. And you, you understand better than most, the slim personnel base staffing bases in these places. So what support is being given to these frontline workers in these remote places to deal with, you know, how to navigate the use of a rat test, for instance? Someone's gonna to to explain that to someone, how to use it. I mean, I even have to have someone to play, explain it to me, but um, if you're in the bush and you've got no idea, yep. this is an additional task and a burden on people who are already flat strapped. Yeah, so one of the, I mean, acknowledging the importance of maintaining the ACHO and remote workforce um, as much away from furloughs as possible, etc., is why there was that initial commitment from the beginning to provide rats um, to ACHOs in the, as a part of the highest priority, like, like um, residential educator facilities. Um, the initial deployment was a mix of point of care tests and self tests. Point of care tests need to be administered by a health professional. Self tests are, are the ones that people can purchase commercially and use themselves. Um, both modalities come with um, instructions and support for training. We also work with the National Aboriginal Community Cultural Health Organisation with NACHO um, that we provide funding uh, for and through as part of the COVID response to develop also resources to support um, those actors and their workforces on the use of this technology. We had feedback from services that they had a preference for self-test as opposed to point of care tests because they can also be given to non-clinical staff to use and they don't rely on having a clinician providing the test. So from that, uh, uh, beside that initial supply, all ongoing supply of tests to actors um, okay. is only self-test. So we're working with the services very, very directly uh, on using them. We're also holding uh, we were holding fortnightly webinars with all the ACHOs uh, and NACHO, co-hosted with NACHO, to uh, troubleshoot through these issues. We've moved them to weekly um, in, the, in the recent weeks to make sure that we provide support for the RAD deployment and the uh, oral treatment deployment. So is it, has the ACHOs made a request for additional financial support for their range of activities that they undertake? So, Senator, we, uh, the government has provided um, nearly $35 million to specifically support um, the vaccination. Some of that money has gone directly to NACHO and to ARCHOs as well. So there has been financial support provided. Um, I was also going to did, add- Sorry, to did you say some of that went to them? Yes, absolutely. Out of the 35, what went to them? So I think- 34.3 million. That's right. $34.3 million have been provided. So that's more than some, that's a fair <laughs> wag of it. Well, we, 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 we don't want to oversell. Um, <laughs> that's all right. Sorry. I just wanted to make sure I heard properly, that's all. Indeed, Senator. And I was also going to add to Dr de Tocca's answer before. We've also done a lot of work around communications and translation um, of instructions and different uh, communication products. So happy to go through that uh, with Ms Belmano, if you would like. Yeah, I suppose my other big question is the quarantine issue in the overcrowding of houses. And how is that being managed or... It obviously sets back the good work that, <laughs> as frontline health providers, that uh, you go back into a house with 20 or 30 people, it's just going to make the yeah. next wave of people come knocking on your door, isn't it? So, Senator, right from the start, um, back in 2020, we had made provisions for uh, remote uh, preparedness and retrieval. So. We had worked with all of the ARCHOs and NACHO at that point in time to put in preparedness plans across all of the ARCHOs and the communities. Um, there are a number of measures in place that go to whether we need to isolate or retrieve or put in place uh, additional kind of isolation facilities and clinics in communities. Um, Dr. Tocca, did you want to add? Yes, yeah, so, so Mr. Bridgman is absolutely right, recognising that 
um, isolation um, could be a challenge in many remote communities and the uh, larger number of people per house um, in general. That, that was one of the first focus on the original management plan for back in, from back in March 2020. And the but I'm so sorry, Doctor, I know that, but, but that's even true of Halls Creek and Fitzroy Crossing. Little towns have got a little clinic which is battling to meet you know, the day-to-days, let alone additional people, and yet there's no evidence that the, if they're going to be evacuated out of Bulgo, Billaluna, or Mullen, or wherever, they'll end up in Broome, or they end up in Derby, or where there are already limited you know, facilities. Um, what's the collaboration with the Commonwealth and the state in trying to ensure that there is you know, proper facilities for people who are at the tough end of it uh, to go to, rather than, oh, well, we don't know where to put them. We'll put them in a, put them in a um, quarantine place and hope they stay alive. So th that's absolutely key, uh, Senator, as, as, as you identified. The direct management of the outbreak situation and the public health response in a particular community is led um, by the relevant state and territory, in this case by, by WA, of course. Um, but we are working very closely on, on, on this, as we have with, the, with all the other jurisdictions. In WA's case, there's a particular advantage with um, the eventual outbreak, when or if it happens, happening after what's, what's happened in other jurisdictions. So through the National Aboriginal Community Control, uh, sorry, Aboriginal and Tosha Andra Advisory Group on COVID-19, and the other mechanisms that we have for uh, Commonwealth and state collaboration, a lot of the uh, discussions in the, in the recent weeks have been focused on how we translate the lessons learned from uh, both Aboriginal communities and state and territory governments and the Commonwealth government uh, from the outbreaks in Western New South Wales for the current outbreaks across the eastern states from the management of remote outbreaks in the Northern Territory, including some of the shifts in approaches that we are seeing with Omicron responses versus Delta responses. Um, a lot of our planning uh, throughout last year, our joint planning with the states and territories and their community control health sector uh, was based on um, containing absolutely every Delta case in a, in a setting in which vaccination uh, or two doses of vaccine provided um, uh, a, a sort of stronger barrier in preventing transmission. We know that with Omicron, the infectivity is higher and the effectiveness of the vaccines to prevent infection, they remain, remain really effective in preventing severe disease, um, but two doses are less effective against Omicron in order to sure. prevent infection. The plans to absolutely isolate and take every single case out of the community to prevent an outbreak um, are not necessarily fit for the current pandemic. Um, so we, are, uh, we have been working through the advisory group with all the jurisdictions to make sure that the approaches have the right fit um, to our current, current context in which um, outbreaks are inevitable sure. across the country, but the, the severity for people who are vaccinated is much lower okay. um, so they can be contained. Well, last question, Madam Chair. I'll probably just to add just to one thing. It's Gavin Matthews oh. first, the Secretary of the Indigenous Health Division. Is that late last year, all of the jurisdictions did update their, um, their Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander uh, you know, COVID response plans for outbreaks as well. So there was a process they went all through all to update those. And as um, I think Dr. Doc has said, I mean, that then feeds into the advisory group, which is, you know, regularly up updating and ensuring that you know, discussion between the Commonwealth and the states is ongoing to sort of refine it for how the, the outbreak progresses. Sure. I mean, I, I, because I live in Broome. I don't have those discussions. I need to know what they're saying and what the plans are going to be. And the people beyond me are even worse off. But my last question, if I might, goes back a bit. It's, it's outside the virus base. We used to have some discussions in here about bloodborne diseases, if you can re remember that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what's happened to the, to the medical uh, attention required for those sorts of ongoing chronic or, um, you know, uh, challenges in this field as well. So is everything put on hold because we all stuck on the virus response or you're still dealing with STDs and other bloodborne types of yes, problems? Senator, because that was so, rampant, if you recall, so, across so, Northern Australia. Yep. So, Senator, um, the, all the normal programs are still continuing. I mean, obviously, COVID has an impact on everything in life, including um, programs. So there will be, I'm, I'm sure, for many services that face a, um, you know, an outbreak and a sudden influx of work across that, that may impact on those things from time to time. Um, but, you know, our work on, uh, you know, BBV and STIs and, you know, syphilis has not stopped or slowed down. Um, 
you know, those things, those programs continue. We've extended the funding, for example, for the enhanced syphilis response, uh, you know, for another three years, there's about another 23 million um, committed to that uh, last year to extend that for a further three years and sort of ensuring those things going. The point of care testing is still in place. Uh, the, in fact, I think I was looking at some data, the testing, um, you know, is still, is, has still been occurring. So we've been watching some of the data for that and we're not seeing significant drops in some of those things, particularly some of the STI testing is maintained over that period, which has been very good. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for your responses. Thank you very much, Senator Dodson. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all for attending today. I'd like to ask some questions about Mornington Island following my questions last year, and then perhaps some general questions. Um, how did the federal government allow the Mornington Islanders' situation, their health and wellbeing, to slip into third world countries? So, Senator, Mornington Island, and I think we've, we've provided some answers to questions on notice that we mm -hmm. took the last time. Um, as you're aware, we work closely with Archos, we work closely with the community, but um, particularly with Mornington Island, we work very closely with the Queensland Health and Hospital Services there. Um, and we are working uh, with them closely to make sure that the services on the island are improved over time. I don't know whether Mr. Could, Mr. could you Matthews. tell me how you're working with the government? Mr. Matthews? So, well, there's a number of range of us. I mean, it's a very broad question, of course, it when is. you get to health, because you, you can't differentiate the health and wellbeing from the broader people's social and environmental I agree. Uh, you know, aspects around that. So I, I think really probably, you know, the, the headline way I would say that that response to that is uh, sort of happening really is through closing the gap, which is the, you know, the framework for government states to be working in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, around, you know, improving outcomes generally. And so I guess that, that agreement was signed, you know, struck in the around the middle of 2020, um, so it's been in place for about 12 months, which really resets the, I guess is the aim is to reset the relationship and it is looking around a broad range of um, factors uh, to work in, you know, I guess rather than doing things with, you know, two people, it's that concept of doing things with people and bring them to the table and then look at how the overall investment across those range of things from, um, you know, education, employment and housing through to health and health outcomes, you know, come together uh, around that situation is, uh, is probably really, I think is probably the, in a nutshell, the main context of your answer about how that's going to progress you know, into the future from here, of which health is a, is a part, but it is not the only part um, in relation to that, uh, into that answer, I think. And that, but that's also not a question. It's all, it is also, obviously, when you start to get into the provision of, you know, hospital services on morning time, that is, you know, they're delivered by the Queensland Government, as is a range of the education services and those things. So it's not a kind of simple Commonwealth Department of Health question. It's a very broad question. And I think in that context, probably, you know, understanding the, you know, the landscape through the lens of where closing the gap is resetting that and some of the other um, mechanisms, and particularly where Senator Dodson was asking and things like the development of the voice are really, you know, geared towards ensuring about empowering and encouraging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be a little bit more in charge of their future, which will hopefully, you know, that will lead to increased outcomes over time. Okay, some wonderful points in that that I'd like to continue with. First of all, I endorse and value your comments about needing a, an holistic approach. Health is just one part of it. So, and health is really an outcome of the whole way of life. So I, I understand that. Um, what are the current initiatives? That was a very broad statement, but what are the current initiatives for working with the Queensland Government um, and, and doing anything directly? And the Premier of Queensland and the Queensland Health Minister promised to visit the island last year or early this year. Have they done so? I, look, I, 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 I couldn't comment on anything from the Queensland Government or their ministers or intentions around that. We don't have visibility or necessarily monitor or track that because that's obviously a matter for the, for the Queensland how, Government. How, more specifically, how do you work with the Queensland so Government? So from a health point of view, and I, I mean, our colleagues from um, the National Indigenous Australians Agency may be able to talk more broadly from a um, broader Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs perspective, but from the health perspective, probably from two mechanisms we have, we do have what's called partnership forums with the Queensland uh, in each jurisdiction, including Queensland, where they are um, regular meetings that usually happen a, a few time, couple of times a year between the Queensland health uh, officials, the Commonwealth health officials, and then officials from um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health sector in Queensland. And they're largely geared towards trying to kind of, you know, increase the alignment between uh, the, you know, between the Commonwealth, the state, and the and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander stakeholders that are, you know, many of whom are delivering services in there to ensure that we are, you know, we align our policy and our 
delivery as far as possible. And there are any, you know, not probably talking about Mornington Island specifically, but there are a range of things that will happen through there. Many of the programs we talked about, including things like our CIFLS program, will deliver services into Queensland. Um, we have, um, that will also acknowledge things like um, where probably over the last two years we've been looking to increase the investment in our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services, where we've probably put in about an increased investment in the Aboriginal community controlled health system by probably a bit over 160 odd million. What, what specifically doing what? Uh, so, well, so the investment we've lifted into the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health services is really around increasing the primary resourcing that goes to primary health care delivered by Aboriginal community controlled health services. In communities, that's a little different from Mornington Island because that has a that does not have one directly on there. It does have some servicing through the um, and as a service there um, into the community, but a lot of services delivered by the Queensland government in there. But what we're looking to do is increase the resourcing for health services delivered, primary health care services delivered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations because they know their clients, they know the clients well, and they you know they'll deliver and put in place a stronger framework around comprehensive primary health care. So that is something we've been doing across the country, not just in Queensland, and we'll continue to do over. So is that funding for nurses or doctors or? Uh, that it, both, it, it funds the resource of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Health Clinic, uh, and then the health clinic will use that for any range of things. It might employ Aboriginal health worker, and it you know, could be used for that, could be used for doctors or nurses or um, other things that it may do from a comprehensive um, healthcare point of view, which is really about a patient coming in and not do it, you know, doing and sort of, you know, understanding their needs and then looking at their broader circumstance and spending an increased amount of time. So it's not, you know, it's a little different from your, your visit to a normal GP situation, which might be a little bit sort of shorter. It's to sort of bring them in, spend more time, look at their, you know, their other issues and try and provide some of those wraparound supports to people is really how the um, comprehensive primary health care works within a Aboriginal community controlled health setting. So our one of the thing one of the things we're doing is to try is to increase our investment in that over over time and work with the sector in particular to um, expand that and look to you know improve the how they service over time as well which is their intention so how would you characterize not just the quality of the relationship but the the actions and the behaviors that come from the relationship are you a money provider are you a resource provider are you someone looking over their shoulder in a helpful way that that uh, identifies shortfalls in the Queensland government's approach. Um, are you advisors to them? How would you describe it? Uh, well, are you referring to the Queensland government or for our, you know, the, the Aboriginal health services? The Aboriginal health services with the Queensland government, um, not just Mornington. Well, I, I'd, I would hope that the Aboriginal health services probably don't characterise us as they're just looking over their shoulder. Would be, I would hope. I, I meant um, that in the sense that you're working with them. Yes, that, that's our. That's very clearly our intention is to is to ensure that we have a partnership approach. Uh, with our Aboriginal health services, uh, which is a which is one of the priority reform areas in the closing the gap agreement as well. And that's exactly what I was going to add, Senator. We take the closing the gap agreement very seriously, um, which talks about a partnership with um, Aboriginal people and Aboriginal services. We the money that that Mr. Matthews outlined goes directly to service delivery by community controlled health organisations. Um, we provide funding. So it doesn't go through the state government. No, it doesn't. It goes directly to the sector. Um, it funds. It, it's deliberately flexible to allow them to address uh, the particular issues around health and providing holistic health services to their community. So it's deliberately flexible to allow for that. Um, and we work very closely with the National Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, but also all of the services to make sure that what we are achieving is a collective set of outcomes that everyone's agreed to around improving health uh, and wellbeing for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Okay, perhaps uh, now would be a time to jump into a few things. Uh, Mr Matthews said, uh, as I said, I, it was wonderful to hear him talking about um, an holistic approach, it's not just health, uh, health's an outcome of, of the lifestyle. Um, what about personal accountability? The, uh, the reason I'm asking these questions is that um, two, three people in my office and myself went up right across all the Cape York communities. Um, gee, when was that? July, August. And visited all. And the, there were common, although the communities are quite different, as you would appreciate, um, different in their needs and their backgrounds, they have some commonalities. Uh, one, you mentioned close the gap, Mr. Matthews. Um, 
I put it to some of them that some of the all the communities and got this answer. Uh, I put it to them that close the gap perpetuates the gap, and they resoundingly said yes. And the reason for that was, first of all, the underlying intent is to focus on the gap, which perpetuates the gap. But putting that aside, there's also what some people call the Aboriginal industry, and it consists of whites as well as Aboriginals. But they're consultants, lawyers, etc., that feed off this, and they perpetuate the gap because without the gap, there's no Aboriginal industry. So any comments on that? Well, so, well, sorry, Senator, can I, I... I don't want to speak for, for Mr Matthews, but um, our, our job is to make sure that we can provide comprehensive health care for all Australians. Uh, the government invests significantly in the health and wellbeing of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as First Nations peoples because of the disparity in health outcomes uh, today, and that is what the Closing of the Gap Agreement is, is about. Um, we have worked tirelessly, and the community-controlled health sector has been um, a major part of the infrastructure of delivering health outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people for over 50 years now. And to suggest that, you know, in any way that that is not um, a, a necessary and evidence-based investment. Um, so I just, I, I just wanted to clarify, because asking Mr Matthews for a comment on that, um, it is evidence-based, it is clear, it is a government commitment. Uh, you, would in, you would agree, I would hope, that um, personal accountability has a lot to do with managing people's health. So, Senator, everyone, I think, across the country wants the best health care and the best for their family and themselves. Um, and personal accountability is one element. Uh, we also recognise social determinants of health and a range of historical factors as well. So you're agreeing with me that personal accountability is important. What... Um... Senator, I think I said it was one of the factors. Correct. It, it, it's one of the factors, so it, is, it, is, it has a part to play. So what we've done in this country, um, under both Labor and Liberal, is that since 1972 we have, according to people in the communities, they've told me that we've created a sense of victimhood. Not, not beggars, but a victimhood. And that's the opposite of accountability. So what I'm trying to do is to get an understanding of the environment in which you work, because if, if that accountability is not there, and, and these people in the communities are wonderful. There's a diverse range of them, as you know, but they seem to be held back by the Aboriginal industry. Maybe not deliberately, maybe subconsciously, but that's what's happening. And a lot of it's been caused by state and federal governments, particularly um, since 1972. Look, I think we can probably, I mean, from, I, we're probably a little bit limited to speak from the health perspective. It's obviously the, where our responsibility is, but I think it would be, probably just to repeat, Sarish, I think it would be um, not right to characterise the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, um, the community controlled health sector, which is delivered and run by Aboriginal people for Aboriginal people as a, you know, in a negative connotation around an Aboriginal industry, I think is that the reason we fund them is I think because of your point around which it is to, that services delivered, you know, good services delivered by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and we are talking about the provision of health services, um, is there is clear evidence that it is you know, it is effective in delivering it because it comes from an empowering place of empowering That's people to do it. That's what I was after. And that is why we are growing the sector strongly and investing in it and trying to work very closely with the sector on the way through. It's why when, I think if you were listening to Mr. Dr. Totoka's uh, evidence around our response to COVID, we've also have centred that 100% uh, with Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people and, and you know, experts around that to, for that very reason. So what I'm interpreting, and it's very welcome if I'm interpreting it correctly, is that you're giving more responsibility to the communities for their for their health and managing that health? The, I'm sure that, uh, and this is a, you know always very difficult to verbal, um, but I would imagine from our um, colleagues in the uh, in the Aboriginal community controlled health sector, they would say they you know they are services that are you know that their membership is the community, and their manage you know and their um, boards are elected from their community, so they would say they are in and of the community is but how they I'm sure would um, express their view very strongly around that in, in terms of providing services to their own people. Well, that's welcome news. So is there a, is there a plan within your uh, organisation 
that is part of an overall plan within the government's, I don't know, what's uh, Ken Wyatt's department name, title? Department of Aboriginal and Island Affairs or Indigenous? The National Indigenous Australians Agency. That's right. Thank you, okay. Uh, is there a, a coordinated plan with them, working coordination with so, them? So, uh, Senator, and um, something you could, uh, you know, easily Googleable that is hard to find. So if you Google the uh, National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan, um, you'll find that there's a recently released, uh, you know, national Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan that was released on around the 15th of December last year, which is now a new 10-year um, national plan around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, uh, worked up very extensively um, by, you know, with, probably led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health experts in the sector around the development of that plan, refreshed to be consistent with closing the gap and embed many of the things we've learned over the last a uh, few years that was, as I said, released in uh, the middle of December, and that has at its very heart that, that concepts of how the broader social determinants link with health and also very strongly, uh, you know, uh, brings in a dimension around the cultural determinants of, uh, of health and how culture plays out for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and impacts on their health um, and how health needs to respond to that landscape as well. So that's been recently refreshed and I think would probably be, if you're looking at the national plan, um, where that is, that is probably the prime and most important one to have a look at. So I'd really encourage you to do that. We can provide the link on notice if you like, to um, just to refresh if you'd like. If not, that's okay. Um, and that would be well worth, to, worth having a look at. And also noting that that is endorsed by the majority of the states and territories uh, as well. So it, is a, it does really form a plan now that is um, developed in and of through the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander sector, agreed by the Commonwealth Government and endorsed by states and the, the majority of states and territories. Okay, thank you. That, that's welcome news too, because um, there are a lot of outstanding people with a lot of potential in those communities Sorry. who are just stymied by an invisible hand somehow. So. Um, that's, and, and it's varying from, say, Lockhart River, where they're really going ahead um, to other countries. Senator Roberts, just quickly, we are very close to time, and I have one question that I would like to ask the officers before we finish up. So, if you Has, could... Last question, Thank then, you. Chair. Thank you for that notice. Has there been a drop in the death rate from suicides in the last year, and what's the overall trend in suicide? Because it was quite alarming. So, Senator, I might go to my colleague online, Mr Rodham, who can talk about uh, specific suicide um, data and prevention activities. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you see me and hear me all right? Yep. Yeah, great. Uh, yes, so overall uh, in 2020, Senator, there was a 5.4% uh, reduction in suicide for the whole population. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, suicide remained the fifth leading cause of, cause of, death, cause of death that year and uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to die by suicide at more than twice the rate of non-Indigenous people. So 27.9 per 100,000 population compared with 11.8 per 1,000 population. So what, is, can you tell me the overall trend? I, I know relative to the, the rest of Australia, it's high. So thank you for that, double. What's the overall trend? Is it increasing, decreasing, flat? Over, over. Uh, it did increase slightly in 2020, uh, Senator. So I'm just trying to get the figures of for 2020 compared with 2019. I know uh, it was a little higher while the whole of population rate fell. Senator, I can the provide. Time, we can take that on notice and give you the data around uh, the trends, but it also goes to why we are investing heavily in suicide prevention and mental health activities across Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, we have a crisis line that's 24-7 that is about to be launched um, and we'll start services from the 24th of February uh, and a range of other activities that Senator Dodson well knows we've been undertaking around suicide prevention. And um, just like physical health, it's an outcome, mental health is an outcome of cultural and other factors. Social factors, I think, Mr Matthews' words. There's a range of social determinants that impact on an individual's health across the board. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you all for attending. Thank you very much, Senator Roberts. I just have um, one final question about um, misinformation regarding vaccination programs and quarantine programs in remote communities. Have we seen any misinformation um, circulating in those areas? And if so, what's the department been doing to counteract that? 
Thank you, Senator. Um, so misinformation around COVID and the vaccine program um, is, I think, present in all aspects of our, of our society. Indeed, indeed. Um, there have been a number of unfortunately targeted um, elements of misinformation um, towards remote communities or, or First Nations communities, uh, which have been um, quite unhelpful in the rollout of the program. Um, like any aspect of the, of the COVID response, as, uh, as Mr. Matthews outlined, um, everything that the government is doing is in close partnership with their communities uh, through the closing the gap framework and the advisory group arrangements. So we, we're working really closely with uh, Aboriginal organisations, with, with communities, uh, supporting uh, work that Nacho is leading in partnership with um, NAAA and Minister Wyatt um, to specifically um, target uh, identified pockets of potential sources of misinformation, but also providing as much factual, uh, fact base and, and clear material as we can to uh, the community organisations, community radios, First Nations media, um, local health services, so that those materials can be tailored, adapted um, and, and provided in a way that is appropriate for that community in, in some areas where there might, be, there might be mistrust of governments or something coming from um, from directly from a government source might not have the same impact. Um, we essentially want to have a, and have had over the last two years um, an approach of um, not just trying one avenue, so having uh, our official campaigns and our official me messaging with specific uh, First Nations tailored and First Nations developed uh, materials while also providing um, and support through other non-traditional non uh, means, uh, providing customizable material so that communities can, ad can adapt, translating into more than 15 um, First Nations languages and changing quite constantly as the, as the needs uh, evolve, the message evolves and the feedback from the communities um, evolves. We've, we've filmed videos, uh, facilitated the filming of videos from community members uh, when a community was impacted for an uh, by an outbreak so that uh, messages could be um, tailored directly to that community, but also other communities could learn from the lived experience of, of people who were experiencing an outbreak in their own community. So it's a whole range of uh, different approaches um, that ultimately um, provide empowerment for the community to message to itself, because um, that's way more uh, effective than a, a single um, government source um, repeating the same message. Thank you very much, Mr. Tocker, and all of the uh, officials for attending here today. That concludes the committee's cross-portfolio hearing on Indigenous matters. I would like to thank the minister and all of the officers who have given evidence to the committee today and thank Hansard and Broadcasting for their assistance. And I now declare this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee adjourned. Thank you.